Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, are you familiar with the, the Blue Brain project? No. Uh, they're trying to, I mean, there's been this overly ambitious project, I think, in Switzerland. This guy decided to map the brain of an entire, like uh, the entire brain of a rat. So uh-huh. in a very analogous way. So it's creating basically these connections. And there is, you know, some uh, will to, to think different, but I think it came with great difficulties. It's actually not so feasible to just do one, like you're saying, it's, it's a bit of both, it's digital and analog. But what was interesting is that they started tied to what you're saying, Kevin, about topology. They introduced uh, algebraic topology to figure out these different geometries, actually, that the, they're forming in the current neural nets with, and, and it, it had this, I don't know, 11, I might be wrong, but like it was this 11 dimensional uh, mathematical models. And it got really crazy. They didn't yeah, make just... sense, but, you know, just the, the beauty of the exploration. And I think, you know, the island model with Kevin's, it's like it leads to that kind of thing. It's not for sense making as much as it's for exploration in a way you're like, is this right? Is this meaningless? Is this something? So. Yeah. Yeah, one of the difficulty of these kind of tools is like you don't want to prescribe necessarily a, a, a predefined answer, you know. Um, <clears throat> this is where I, I, I like the, maybe it's not so true, but <laughs> but I like the idea it's more like an epistemological framework than than a, a, a real pragmatic tool, you know, because because for you is uh, it, it, it helps you think about how you access certain information and how to to judge the quality of this information, um, and it gives you like visual representation to define exactly what kind of well, at least the idea is that it should give you some kind of visual representation of what what kind of um, uh, what kind of layer of information it is. Uh, if you had to, as Diana said, as you if you had to map it. Uh, in the shape of an island. If you had to say, okay, what I'm uh, going through right now, actually, if it looked like uh, it, an, an island, um, we don't really care for now the, the shape of it, right, the, the actual shape of it, but we care of its topology, like what are main things that, that uh, you know, uh, define how flow information of information uh, you know go through this uh, this ecosystem how the mo- what are the, like basically this idea of having mountains that uh, you know will have a huge impact on on the development of the ecosystem on the island and um, <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah the, the it will also uh, constrain the type of interaction that this ecosystem will, will be able to to sustain or, or not you know so this idea of uh, topography is, is make at least it makes sense as a, as a metaphor to say okay if I'm able to you know to visualize that kind of thing then I am able to categorize what what are meaningful information for me then I'm yeah. able to make better decisions about what I'm trying to understand and then uh, act uh, upon um, now it's it's right now it's just a metaphor right I can provide explanation but how right. do you put that in practice? How does that become tools for people to be used? Is where we are still missing some. <laughs> some I think well, we also need to look at one essential thing. It's like, what is the tool implicitly requiring you to do? Because, you know, now I am seeing actually better as you're describing. It's, it asks you, it makes you ask questions. You need to ask, be really good at asking questions about your problem, about these different things that happen in your environment because you know we struggle with when we create a new tool we have like a you know big larger scale like a volcano or like a tree or like a fire but these you know you have to create certain elements and you know describe it also in the abstract counterpart of the kind of problems you can solve but you know sometimes when we actually experiment with people who've never tried them we see that they have no idea what we're trying to do and we have to fill in that gap before they can figure it out. So, you know, one issue is actually how do you figure out that implicit part that you're expecting someone to know? Because you're so immersed in, you know, in your ability to think and it's such a part of you that you can't actually see. Well, so you have to, like, how do you build a system which you can 
um, kind of deceive yourself or impress yourself, right? And, and that's, that's how, that's also asking yourself the critical question of what is the element of surprise for you? And what is the element of like impressive demonstration of skills and tactics and, um, and, and, and representation of the abstract? Yeah. So uh, when you say something like building this island model, the first question I would ask is, you know, what, what medium? Is it some kind of like a, a 3D model or if it's a rendering, right? If it's a rendering, then what is the most efficient way to provide a rendering that, um, you know, uh, drives a certain behaviors and actions of users, right? So like, is it, is it a rendering that is supposed to look realistic and impressive? And, and done in a way where you don't spend too much time, you know, um, making sure that the mountain looks good. So you can actually create an algorithm, you know, that, uh, that creates fractal um, generated, you know, mountainscapes so yeah. that it looks good and it's efficient, right, for the purpose of making something look good without a lot of effort, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's where, you know, um, that's where the, the the question, the epistemological right uh, aspect of designing a model as representation of, of pure abstract is, do, you know, do you let go of control so that you can be an efficient, uh, you know, model creator, and then have that model later on be like an inspiration tool, but then you're kind of like stuck in the universe of. What, what 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 you began with right so you have this hysteresis you have like a path dependency of your choices uh, of your you know ultimately of, of how you've narrowed your own field of vision in order to uh be efficient right mm -hmm. and and so you lose redundancy you lose like the, the complete scope of things in order to achieve things and and you know this is the problem this is the paradox of uh, being pragmatic and being, you know, completely true, right? Yeah, that, that's exactly the reason for now. It's, it's, it sits well as a metaphor. I know that we, get, we could argue that any model is a form of metaphor of reality, right? But it's, yeah. it's not really, for me, it's not so, so true because we try to represent something that acts as with predictability on what will happen. Here, it's not really, do, it's not really, like it's not 100 percent the goal like if you don't want a model you don't want an actual model that works and that can tell you what will happen right uh, it's it's more like a, a, a tool for thinking uh, of the situation it, it, like it provides so, you know, visual, the... like you, you could say that each time you go to the prime you redraw a new map of the island and it's not a prime at all because because it it it, it, it just helps you visualize your new state of understanding and I, I would, personally, I would be totally fine with that. It's not, um, this is where, um, like, I want to differentiate maybe the, the, the metaphor of the island as, as a philosophy of seeing what you are trying to do, what you are trying to achieve, and the tools themselves. Because I want to say something that, about what Diana said before. Like, if, we, if I had to create tools, I agree with, with you, Diana, that they should be able to stand by themselves in, in the sense that uh, they don't need to be as, you know, as in the idea of island and stuff like that to understand what, what is the goal of the tool, right? And what, what it should uh, enable you to do. Now, it, can, it will work, it has to work within the metaphor of the island because it should still help you to visualize that, that idea of, of island. Now, I, I like if we talk about the island as uh, as the <clears throat> the metaphor. Um, this is not something that we want. Like I, I, I would like to to avoid the situation you just described, Matt, of path dependency, because uh, because I don't care of the historicity of my model. I can throw it in the in the trash tomorrow and start again, because my understanding totally changed. Uh, between yesterday and, and today and it's, it's it, it shouldn't be an issue because what you are trying to do with the metaphor is gaining new perspectives it's not keeping yours right it's not protecting yours and and proving it proving it to be right it's the quite the opposite right? 
that you want yeah, to. So, so it's lowering basically the cost of rendering time, right? And so this is this is actually one of the approaches of a lot of these AI generated, you know, Dali stuff is yeah. um, is, is is basically giving you multiple renderings in like very very few seconds, you know, ten seconds to get like mm -hmm. ten images, and then you can have a parallel, uh, you know, competition sort of right in your own mind, you know pitching one against the other and then to basically from a binary branching yeah. finding your you know superior one right and 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 even then you can always go back and like say maybe i wasn't correct in this you know march 16 you know madness um uh, uh tournament style type of uh way and you could go back and pick you know uh, the third place person and, and so on mm -hmm. so forth and, uh, you know, one one quick thing about abstraction though is um there's actually a very huge usefulness in having these types of abstractions allow you to explore things. For instance, when in the turn of the century, when um, you know, kind of like the 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 atomic model was uh, you know created uh, by physicists, it it did perfectly for uh, the hydrogen atom, but it failed. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, as you go on and on and. easily uh, understand right with uh with with mathematics and algebra immediately but the geometry later on you know once once it's been explored and it was really just a simple concept of of, of you know how how quantum uh, uh kind of affects the geometry of electron orbitals then it's like ah it's, it's clearer even though you cannot express it in a very simple um uh, mathematical way, it's clearer, right? Thank you for joining, Crazy. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just want to show you uh, to show you maybe what, what one. I, I try to use it on uh, something a bit more concrete, um, just that we you, you you can visualize yourself what I uh, right. What I mean by throwing away my <laughs> my map of islands. Um, okay, I'll try to share my screen. Hopefully it will work. Oh yeah, tunnel window. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you see my screen? I don't see you, but I can see that you said yes. Um, is Matt still here? Oh, we just disappeared. Oopsie. <laughs> that's that's crazy. <laughs> that's better. I felt drawn into yeah. this spiral. <laughs> Losing me out of the matrix. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, is he? Oh yeah, he was in the lobby. Yeah. Hey, Matt, we lost you. Oh, for sorry, a sorry, I, I I lost you there real quick. But yeah, <laughs> I, I I saw I saw a glimpse of kind of like the cellular polygons. Yes, um, I tried to share it again. Accidentally refreshed my screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No worries. Uh, so here is the the idea of the map. You, you see, it's it's really basic uh, as yeah. a representation yeah. model because we we want to be quick in our ability to to draw what we think is uh, the representation of the island, right? In this case, it was. Have you ever uh, used rawgraphs.io? Um, because no. it's it's one of the tools that I kind of use for data re data visualization. Um, because then you could like choose from like 20 different types of graphs uh, of just using one, you know, uh, Excel sheet of data. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the idea is here is, is that I populate the data as, as I, you know, ha as I'm mapping the, the, what I believe is the, the, the context, right? So I, I sure. never went into the context I was trying to, to map. It was an exercise that was given to me and basically it was to, to the challenge was to create um, like to think about solutions around um, 
identity credential management and digital identity and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So what I try mm -hmm. to do is like map the context of what I believe is the, the context of this kind of uh, challenge. And here is uh, the representation. So in, in red, you have the, the mountains, which are things that are stable, that's really low. So things that are that are likely to influence uh, the, the, you know, how information moves. Then we have the hill, the jungle, uh, the shores, and the water. Uh, so I tried to, to represent that as it was just my guesses. Okay, it was nothing more than that. Uh, okay. I, I don't know. I don't know if anything of what I just mapped is true. And I, for now, I just don't care because now I know that there's places I can go to try to, to yeah, to see if it's true, you know, and change my map as as I, I go to I move into my understanding of the situation, right? But here I try to, to, to map it this way and the advantages of hexagons is like they, they provide some adjacent uh, possibilities. Uh, so everything that is uh, adjacent to any of the side uh, kind of connects them together and I feel like visually it, it works pretty well. Then <clears throat> I try to make a drawing of that, you know, of what it could look like if it was an actual island, you know. And yeah. I found it really funny <laughs> to, to see it this way. It's not useful. It's more than, it's more like um, a way, if you wanted to share that with others, uh, it would, I, I think it would help them contemplate the situation, right? In that sense. And I, I feel like it's a, it's a nice way to visualize your, your information, uh, you know, uh, and maybe it would be fun if it could be like an actual 3D model <laughs> that you could, you know, move around. Uh, but I'm not good at that, so <laughs> I didn't even try it. Uh, but, you know, it took me like a, a 10, yeah, about 5 to 10 minutes to draw that. It's really fast and it's really fine for what I'm, I was trying to, to do, you know. Um, That's pretty good. Did you use like just your mouse? Uh, it was on my iPad. I used, um, what is the name? Oh. Uh, like pen, pen, pencil, pencil, yeah, yeah. So I, it took me like really like I had basically five colors to to play with, uh, yellow, red, green, blue, <laughs> and I don't know like um, uh, black, white, and that's it. So uh, it's really basic, it but it does the job. Strange geography. If you think about the geological event yeah. that had to cause this island. You know, it would be really interesting to think about what the hell happened. How did that yes. happen? Yes, yes, I agree, uh, and that's funny because uh, this is where the the, I mean, the metaphor is it, it plays with the idea of, of natural things, you know, whereas clearly we explore uh, um, an uh, at least you know um, massively artificial uh, context, uh, because here if you see like local governance, you know, local public education, scientific research institutions, housing and stuff like that. Those are totally artificial stuff, right? So it, it feels like in the, you know, in the uncanny valley of uh, organic and yet uh, something that is not totally, you know, right as a natural thing. So I agree. It's a, it's a good, uh, good point. Um, and then I use um, that's to like to the, like some scenarios about some cases where you know interactions that make sense in in the the challenge would be useful. Um, and I picked this one, the scenario two, where students request public transport subscription, and it has it needs some identification credentials to 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 be able to do that. Um, and where like if you see the housing mountain where it plays a role it's like if if the student wants to use public transport it's probably to move from house from his house to to the education place because he's a student right so this this makes even more you know it gives the uh, more meaning to to the original map actually and then from that, I tried to extrapolate. So basically, I reused in black some of the items that I felt was really like um, central to the the scenario to work, and I explored around that what are the opportunities 
for a, a you know a, a, um, identity credential system to to bring something interesting you know uh, and here I just uh, like there's some random ideas and there's some some that I I feel like works really well like with this idea of uh, being able to, to participate in the actively participate as a citizen in the public transport initiatives and actually shape it you know uh, which is interesting and creating some kind of shared value system or something like that where people participate in, in any form either for voting or for actually being able to sustain the, the quality level of the, of the transportation system like why not having citizens that uh, you know uh, so sometimes time are working uh, at the public transports um, you know uh, within the public transport infrastructures and then in exchange of what there's some shared retrib retribution or shared value creation I don't know some some ideas like that and and you could imagine that the same system can allow you to you know handle emergency situations so I had like a bunch of ideas uh, then I tried to like draw quickly some visual of that I won't go into the details right now and and then from that I tried to create some some archipelagos of uh, <laughs> outcomes that I would like to see from from those different things, right? Um, what they could bring as things that are relevant for us to either measure or monitor uh, as good outcomes that we would like to see. Um, so, so that's about it. And you see here that it's, it's different layers, different maps. Um, they don't have necessarily direct connections, but it just helps to me. At least it helped me to make sense and to like it makes sense because there's connections, there's meaning, there's meaning in between the you know in between the the different things, and the fact that they are grouped usually and it's just accidents because it was as I you know was dropping the hexagons and writing down the ideas that it generated that. Uh, and I'm sure if I try again right now, we could, with you guys, we could generate something totally different. And it's not a problem that those, those, those different um, ontologies of what we understand, right, uh, could exist in the same place. Uh, but it's not an issue because we don't have to decide yet. What, what is the, tr the, but where is the truth, right? Because for now, it's just like there's actually no stake. <laughs> you know, there's no. There's nothing to to realize here for now, but because it was a challenge, but uh, yeah, basically for you, that's. Uh, woo, stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, that. but thank you for sharing. Um, that that helps clear up, um, you know, basically your first stab at it. So then it's like, oh, I I I get the idea of um, taking taking a map that you've filled out so then there's a little bit of investment right by yeah. a user and then like um establishing this like you know an artful you know kind of creation so then it's kind of like there's a value added uh, from your end but then let's go further right you've, you've now been trained into like kind of understanding how your inputs can um can kind of shape this type of profile that you've built for yourself, mm -hmm. right? And, and we can make your profile look good. It doesn't have to be like you necessarily, but your virtual identity or whatever, right? And and then so on and so forth. You can build not just the identity, but how your identity interacts with the greater yes. environment, with society. How to how to actually induce better civil engagement? Like I think the problem you're trying to solve is the fact that some of the best public forum inputs are not in public forums but on dinner tables where people are you know family members are just complaining about public transportation and it's like yes. these are really good insights i wish somebody could just record you and just then post it to youtube or like you know send it to a city council member right but um but you know again like the, the interactions are not happening and the reason why is because people fear uh public speech and so how do you take out that fear of public shaming or reputation uh, stake mm -hmm. on the line, right? And, and di digital allows us to kind of do that. Go ahead, Diana, you, uh, you unmuted yourself. 
<laughs> yes, I, I wanted to actually you know, something clicked as you're talking about how do you you know create the exchange when people you know, kind of fear or they're just passive or not introduced to this kind of thing. But it it also there's a certain conditioning about you know the game of what do you take on an island, but we don't have what do you take out of our island? How can you take the island into the world once you created this? amazing piece how do you actually put the sand in some plastic bags and bring them up do you bring a mountain home or you know it, it makes you wonder how can you re-inject your insights into the world and i think this is one of the greatest difficulties and part of it is like you're saying matt it's these conversations if you can inject it into more people then you know you have uh, kind of a sturdier team to to make the conversation to keep uh, a story alive and uh yeah bring it back but I, at the same time no, no. yeah i mean like you know you could if you were to go on a vacation and you lost your suitcase and you know you never got your suitcase back but a great story emerged and a great vacation happened because you lost your suitcase and didn't have a baggage that's a that's a good thing that's a good vacation and that's a good story you you've earned like from mistakes you earn really good stories the, the the worst thing about making mistakes is if you don't have a story and you end up paying a penalty or whatever then, and there's no story then then there's no value right and um so taking some inspiration from like you know vacation or you know when you're extremely relaxed and and and, and re-energized those are state functions of a personhood where you're kind of I, I wouldn't say peak performance, but in some in some levels of your identity, they're at the peak of their performance, right? And you want that to kind of echo in most cases, but the thing is like, there's not enough room and not, not enough oxygen for every idea to be out there. And that's why in public forums, there's this uh, engagement with the political identity of society. And there's a compromise, there's an endless compromise. And I think... One of the problems of liberalism is that, um, uh, well, so first, before the problems, one of the good things about liberalism is it tries to turn victims into heroes. You know, for, for those who are suffering, you know, you could, you could make it into an interesting story. So it's heroic and you, in, you, 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 you assign courageous points to a victim who decides to come forward and share the story and make it out in the open and that person becomes a hero and then and then you try to assign more of these courageous points out there so then there's more public engagement it's not so much that we want culture wars it's it's so that you can try to create these engagements artificially or induce them right but in some ways they could be misinterpreted as you know like like culture war you know type of things and I, I don't think they're they're intended to be that way, but yeah. Uh, so, what is the way to authentically engage? Uh, I, I think you know that that's 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 one of those things where people have to kind of go back into the drawing board and see how do you uh, fine tune or make a no more nuanced stance of um, of of amplifying certain signals uh, and 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 creating a better you know. Uh, uh, representation, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I think that there are two interesting points you're you're saying, and you know, to to tie it back to the island. Uh, I mean, first things first. You know, every type of engagement will bring some baggage that we take. Yeah, and you can't actually lose it. But what's interesting is actually to place an intent. You know, the, the island, when we tested it, we tried to kind of surround it with a concept and then, you know, build that uh, topography of a certain abstract concept with whatever uh, examples we had and understanding. And it was useful to a certain extent, but actually to place a more concrete uh, intent on why do you even engage with it? It's like, do you, like you're saying, do you go on a vacation there or do you try to solve a problem? Are you trying to escape from your problems? I think, you know, this would bring people closer. If the intent is at least a bit more open, there wouldn't be a need for so much scripting. If I 
kind of empathize or you know, resonate with that kind of intent, I might be drawn to have that conversation more than uh, be drawn to the political side of things where, you know, we end up in debates and polarities, but the island is about exploration, is about staying on a, on a ground where you don't have yeah. to clash and yeah, get too, too argumentative. Yeah. Just thinking about that. I think one one distinction we can make, which because you you were <laughs> we we go in a tangent here, but you were discussing about uh, this idea of culture war, and the the fact that they exist is because there's a um, loss of diversity of, I mean, of means of interaction. Uh, and and this reduced then the the discourse to to some to some aspects the the most salient right the most visible. Um, and it, it's easier to go towards that direction, especially if there's a loss of diversity within the ecosystem, because because it becomes even more obvious that those points are the one that attracts the others, right? So when you have plenty of ways to 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 interact, then then necessarily uh, those elements that tend to attract, they are less uh, capable of attracting, right? They they become less obvious. Now the, the the thing is with the if we go back to the to the metaphor of islands, is um, this as you like the basic statement here the assumption I would say with the uh, the metaphor is that you aim to do something you you see you perceive something you perceive like a, a problem, but you perceive it through your lens through your perspective so, so necessarily you have a bias towards this, this problem because you have access to only a, a, a part of it. You have access to just one little aspect of it. And exactly the same idea that I try to use when I explain the metaphor is that you are on the boat in the middle of the sea. You see the island on the horizon, okay? It's unknown sea, seas, right? So you don't know exactly where you are. You don't know where this, this island is compared to other things, right? So you're a bit, a bit confused. But you see this island, and you see this this shape from from where you are, right? And you can guess that there's mountains, it's a forest, some shores, right? If you go to explore it from where you can land, because this is the, you know, if you go right to it, and you land on the shore, and you explore like this little entrance in the forest, and you you see there's a nice uh, waterfall, a nice uh, you know river, something like that. You could assume a lot of things about the island itself, right? You could say. Well, the island is mainly composed of forests and waterfalls and rivers. Or you could say, okay, maybe I I just see just a little part of it, and maybe on the other side there's a desert, and the mountain is not a mountain; it's a volcano, and the top of the volcano there's a lake. You don't know, right? You you don't know, but you you could you could assume certain things from from what you have seen. This is where it relates to epistemology in that sense, is that it then it provides you with means to represent but then to question what you represent right and to to dig deeper and to 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 create knowledge for you at least for yourself but to make distance with what you believe is the thing that you are observing now the, uh, one of the other aspects that I, I would like to work on even more is tools to create what i i like to call the the sensory network like the something that enables you to have different perspectives at the same time of what is the island. So not assuming that you can have this overview, like this bird eye view of the island, you know, as many system thinkers tend to, like, they, they, they are not expressing it that way, but as soon as you say there's a system and mapping the whole system will help you to understand it, it creates the, the idea that this is possible actually to map the whole system and to 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 have this overview uh which i don't like because because then in this metaphor of the map and the you know the the landscape uh you are an, uh, um you are an um uh, an observer someone that is um you know ex you extract yourself from the situation which is not really true you are not you are never you know um outside of the context you are always a bit in it right you have some you have some beliefs you have some views on certain things um and so bringing new perspectives will help you like you know, take distance with your what you you believe the problem is and and make then different decisions that you could not make otherwise 
Now, why I don't want to lean towards is um, going too far on the side of uh, pluralism and especially like uh, uh, you know um, a form of relativism where everyone is right, where every perspective is is right and every perspective brings some truth about the situation. Uh, because then you have no way to judge, you have no way to dismiss some information that that are obviously for many people wrong, right? Uh, then you, you can only say that people that believe in conspiracies in this space, they are right to believe in those co conspiracies and that the conspiracy itself is true then, right? So you don't want to, to lean towards this situation where, where, where where every perspective can be is just as 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 good as the others, right? So you need other things to distinguish them from, uh, you know, as a value judgment of of the perspective themselves, not the person, but the perspective. And this is where the landscape helps, I would say, because it, then you ground it a bit more into reality, a bit less into abstraction. Uh, but that's my guess. I, I I'm still exploring it, right? So missing tools to. Um, to concretize that, right? But that's the that's the idea. I guess to your last point, some kind of a social scoring system, but without a dictator or without a um, yeah. uh, you know like a an, an arbiter, right? Um, you know, this kind of reminds me of the Raphael School of Athens, where you have Plato and Aristotle and these different perspectives um, or these two perspectives offer really the, the core dialectic of uh, idealism versus realism. And then you have like all these other people representing the pluralism, right? In a sense. And pluralism is, uh, I think it's more of a fact of nature that people just happen to have quite a lot of ideas. And I, I, I agree from your perspective that um, if you adopt the, the ethical notions of pluralism, meaning that there is no right or wrong, then you just have a lot of activity, but not a lot of structure. And without structure, you cannot build or collaborate. And so then you're really trying to attribute um, this priority, this network um, uh, scoring, so to speak, uh, along with the values of the network, which are you know kind of collaboration and 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 and, and some kind of structure, some kind of like uh, power and force, right? The ability to iterate and grow and improve and strengthen um, connections. Right. I, I mean, I, I'm just spitballing a few properties that you may or may you may want to accept or reject. Um, but I think, you know, the, the key thing is actually just kind of, um, you know, kind of like going down the whole list of, uh, of of what you would think to be pseudo virtues and just like giving them kind of like a score of how much they align with the network value. Uh, so to speak, and then just have a framework of how how that that might evolve over time, right? Because um, one of the key things about system understand like system dynamics is that they have very high dependency on initial conditions. Um, so you score, you know, uh, this and that, but yeah. can evolve based upon agent models. Yeah. So, so so you understand like full well how how those things can um uh and then based upon initial conditions it can the end state could e can either go extinct or you know uh you know in three different modes right so yeah. you never know <laughs> um and, and and that's that's one of the key things about i think um uh really having a grasp or really controlling the dials so to speak and like really reducing the degrees of freedom so then that way um uh you're you are having something uh stable and predictable right because i think that that's a feature and pro key property of why reality is quite addictive right is that um there's 
um, there's kind of the notion that you can fail the entire day and do nothing, but then you always have tomorrow to make up for it, right? Yeah. Um, at the same time, every day is an opportunity where you can improve yourself by 1%, right? And then by 70 days, you're, you're going to double that, right? So every, <laughs> every day is an opportunity can be like abstractly uh, considered, but it can also be thrown away and rejected. And it, you know, it's, it's basically treated as a resource. Um, and, uh, and I think it's actually really important to, to actually rationally lay that out and have every rational agent um, be cognizant and aware of that because then they would actually make choices that are a little bit more rational. But the thing is, you also want that irrationality for that exploration and surprise factor too. Because if everybody optimized for the one system uh, you know, prime strategy, then you don't get to explore like novel tactics. And, yeah. you know, and, and you yeah. know, this is, this is the metaverse type of game here, right? In, in some sense, you uh, want rules and people to engage, and then you want to shake up the rules a little bit to see what the dynamic could be, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The, the thing is, like, like the, the usefulness of the map here of the island is, um, well, at, at least to me, to my understanding is, it's 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 in the discovery. It's in the not in the discovery, but in the exploration itself, and then discovering something, then moving from a state of uncertainty to a state of, of certainty. Because because as you explore stuff, like let's say we go back to the map I, I showed you earlier, and we say now now we explore that, okay? But it's not it's not uh, there's no end to this exploration. You could explore many different ways many different adjacencies of what you just explored, right? So there's like a, there's an absolute infinite number of uh, things you could explore. So for me, it's, it's a never-ending ending process. But, but what you already did can be transformed into something that is like, a pro let's say, for the sake of the argument, a product, right? And then you, you become, like, then it becomes a model. Then it, it has some predictability. Then you have control here. One hundred percent. I I um I was a petroleum engineer, right? And so I took geology classes in uh, yeah. college. And uh, you know, our our geology TAs when we are out on field, they basically tell stories of like how um, this rock formation came about. Like there used to be this ancient you know like mm -hmm. ocean then this river came in and this is the reason why you have these structures on the on the rock and basically these stories are uh plausible uh stories yes. right these are the thesis and these are theories and, but but they embellish it in a way where it, you know there's this type of um there's this type of added uh knowledge onto it which makes mm -hmm. it entertaining and it's a story it's a narrative and i i think that's where you're kind of going with that when you can make it type a, a kind of infotainment uh way of teaching um then you're leading uh, more, much more effectively um uh yeah. you know your team or your clients or whatever to your to, to a particular point of view or understanding how you know uh interactions uh, happen right how how the, the the mountain or the structure came about yeah i think another another thing about topology is you can also uh increase the level of complexity by adding you know different plant types different you know um you know vegetation different yes. you know uh microclimates okay. and even animals so then you not only have topology but also taxonomy as well right of like how uh yeah, kind of evolution, how creatures, right, over time uh, interact with the environment and, and so on and so forth. And you see how vegetation changes in dynamic with predator and prey models and, and so on and so forth. And I mean, like, it, it is quite endless, right? And, and most games do not even go this deep to explore <laughs> sustainability in such a significant way. But it is a good teaching mechanism, you know, just from you know just from an ideation perspective i think in, like, you're, you're saying the 
about the game. So I was like, this island might be actually a really interesting experiment to play in Minecraft. <laughs> you know, it's actually design, you know, your, your island template there. I mean, we always hope that sometime in the future we'll have a 3D model for our tools so we can like, play and move things around. But I think yours is much more fit for something that already exists. It would be interesting to see how it takes us in a 3D modeling and actually interacting. You're a subject in the island you're creating. Uh, well, there's there's Ark and there's, you know, um, uh, No Man's Sky. Like, these, these are worlds uh, within games that... Uh, yeah, it can be auto created or uh, yeah, but you or... want to create your own island with you know your conceptual framework and you move along you know the map and just do it bit by bit. I think that might actually, uh, like you know, Lego Serious Play, they were providing this um, program where teams would build stuff out of Lego and. I mean, it wasn't too much of it. Nothing happened at the end. You just flag the most interesting construction. But, you know, just the, the process of building it in a 3D model with your bare hands from scratch was uh, was also an interesting approach to pools. I mean, another way to uh, kind of um, uh, signal uh, this type of project for yourself is giving you a particular superpower to shrink yourself, right, um, down to, like, the... the the size of an atom and then go inside your own brain and having the knowledge of knowing how your brain kind of works and basically mapping it out right or like exploring that the 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 um you know the i guess the discrepancy between what you focus on on a day-to-day -day conscious level basis and how you act on a day-to-day -day basis right there's always that particular discrepancy of how you think you are versus how others see you are and how you actually are right and um i i think you know integrity is one of those things where those all three you know people of of, of self of being are aligned um and that you know if, if the notion of integrity is gone then social cohesion is gone um but i would say that the interpretation that there is discrepancy is also not complete. It doesn't mean that there's a lack of integrity, but also that market forces kind of force us to be hyper specialized in a way, right? You cannot, you know, like you go to a grocery store, but you, you're not a butcher yourself. So you don't know, you know, meat as well as you should, but uh, because, you know, you do, you do design stuff where you're a computer programmer or whatever, right? You're hyper specialized because the market kind of forces you to, and so there's this degree of self-alienation that is, you know, come as a baggage, right, of, of, of being introduced into society this way. And I think, um, you know, I think realizing this through playing with, uh, you know, the topology of this map, right, is a good lesson. You know, that's a good first lesson. And then, you know, we could go on to lesson two, lesson three, lesson four. These are like self-discovery mechanisms. But if they don't discover anything, you can lead them to, you know, kind of like a mini quest, so to speak, a mini mission of just discovering this one basic thing. And this one basic thing is significant enough to improve mental health. Right. And um, and, and, and find connections and, and, and improve relationships that way. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I to be frank, I never thought of the of the map this way, but I find it interesting. I I also like the idea of repurposing the map. So I I was going back to some of the maps we did, and I realized that um, we could reuse them and transform them for other purposes. So I find it as well interesting, and it goes in the same direction as what you just said, Matt. Uh, and and there's yeah, there's also like, this there's yeah. that company. Oh, so there's that company that like um, would give you like a nice looking poster of like um, what the night sky looked like uh, at a particular day or whatever. Uh, yeah. So like, you know, when you met your significant other. So like you could also do this whole like merch uh, aspect of it too, <laughs> where you like you send them the map right back. Like basically this is your map. Them, uh, <laughs> you sell them their dream that they send you, right? Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's what, what Elon Musk does. But as a, as he likes our dreams, and then he sells it back to us. 
Yeah. That's... What about known maps? You know, like how do you actually build the skill for the the island? You know, what if you actually start with geographically real islands and they have to map it in an abstract way? I think that would be fun. I've never thought of how can I look at a real geographic place yeah. and then be like, okay, so can I work with it rather than building it? Uh, or remapping, you know, remapping the remapping what is on the map actually like countries and and cultures. Uh, and you know, um, having the the real map of the geography and the map of what we mapped of the culture, and how alien <laughs> the like two could be. Too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, something like it's it's the place we live in is not actually the place the the actual the actual shape it has on. How the, distorted your mind yes. is compared to yeah. what you're. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I like that. I like, I like the really idea of using the map as probing, uh, as cultural probing. Like it could be really interesting, and mm -hmm. I never thought of that. But sending people the tool to create their map, and ask them to create the map of what they have in mind right now, or the map of how they perceive, you know, this topic, and let them map out and have a collection of maps of, you know, a bunch of people on the same topic and putting them together in the same place and having like this, you know, this um, gallery of maps uh, of the same place, but through different eyes, you know, would be so interesting. And how yeah. similar and different you would they be, you know, this, this would be. I mean, one, I mean it's, a, it's a great idea in principle and a great idea, you know, as, as an idea, but the, the realities of all of these community type uh engagements like even if you built a great tool the 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 main problem is the pareto principle you you always get you always get a bunch of like a few super users that make <laughs> basically everything and then yeah. the the majority are just like there for the ride right mm -hmm. and 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 so when you tell when you say like we you, know, you have a bunch of maps by a bunch of people that's <laughs> that, that's really demanding a that's lot a, of scale. That, that's, uh, scale. you know, that's uh, um, my optimistic assumptions of <laughs> situation, actually. No, no, but no, no, if I, you, I, if I, you I, were, I, if you I, were in a... That's what I meant by that, you know, from an from ideation point yeah. of view, that's, that's, that's superb. That means that you want to create, um, you know, this, this tool of very, very high quality so that it, it does scale. Yeah, but, but you see, if, if you are in a context of, uh, if you are in, in a context of a, a company, and you you are trying to really get a sense of what is the situation for people, then to solve them a situ solve for them a situation with an actual service, right? So here it's really motivated. I think it's really interesting, like cultural mapping. You know, you have an atlas of their cultural mapping. At the end of the day, you want to sit with them and just gather these maps and be yes. able to actually tell something. What this is the raw picture of how your culture looks like, of how your people interact on different topics, and you know, actually being able to read this would be of such value. And I think it would be one of the most unique products you see on the market. <laughs> uh, just, just to think about it, this would be crazy if you, you could do something like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, one hundred percent. I think uh, one of one of the things about cultural differences is that um, some cultures in different situations have different filter modes, right? Because they have different uh, perspectives on mm -hmm. uh, hierarchy and uh, you know how you talk to leaders, how to, you talk to your bosses, mm -hmm. and that create that opens up different types of communication, right? That opens up, to, you know. Um, uh, core lines of uh, of ideas. For for instance, um, I, I read in a book uh, that um, South Korea, right? Uh, originally, they had like a very high incidence rate uh, of of plane crashes, and one they changed one thing that that lowered their incidence rate down to uh, you know all the other international airlines, and you know, lo and behold, it was changing. Um, the cockpit language from South Korean, from, from, from Korean, right, to English. Because uh, with embedded within the cultural context of the language, you have the, the junior pilot is, is, 
is subservient or, you know, is, is junior, right? It's officially junior to the senior pilot. And so you, you never question the senior pilot's judgment. And, and in English, you have this different dynamic, right? And, and so it's a really interesting thing that this change in language uh, it created a different cultural space that actually created a better outcome, right? Yeah. From a case study perspective. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, just to, to tell you, Kevin, uh, if I remember well, uh, I think one of the David Snowden's approaches to sense making was that he was going into these big organizations and he was using this, I don't know, what's his software tool does, but the, he was making, yeah, the basically write a lot of their I don't hear you well anymore. I don't know why. Me? Yeah, now it's working fine. Yeah, that's weird for just a bit. It was like you you were covering your your mouth or something. It was really weird. Yeah, I haven't done anything. <laughs> no, just to, to yeah. quickly point that out because yeah. I I gotta leave in a bit. Uh, so it was you know it, it's it's very similar to what you could do with the island metaphor. He was basically making them ask answer some questions and some self-reflection. And over time, he would analyze that data and show them how much they can improve. And this was, you know, all great. But I think, you know, with your island metaphor, you'd be able to actually create a much more visual and, you know, enthralling uh, mm -hmm. version of that, of with that self-reflection, not just self-reflection, but like team reflection of how they can solve that problem. And it could be like a short exercise. If you could like condense it to, let's say, 15 minutes of island work, per day or per week and you'd yeah. gather that you know let's say 12 months then you'd have this really crazy compiled data and you know i i have a great idea for uh how you could actually create an industry newsletter for any industry uh based on your island uh idea and um so in in marketing po in market polling um there's this thing called the delphi method and it's where you poll, um, you know, like 30 uh, different CEOs and just ask them to like, you know, answer really simple questionnaires, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and the whole idea is if you, if you collate all of uh, the, the crowd wisdom of um, industry leaders, you get a better uh, picture of, of, of uh, how, how things are, right? And, and if, you, if you can somehow take their opinions and map it in a way that is, you know, kind of mm. like an executive summary, but in visual format, and then you could sell that mm. for sure. Yeah. You actually give people the incentive to learn, right? Mm. The, the rules of reading the map because there is embedded knowledge, right? So you kind of also created this whole treasure map perspective, this like Girardian desire right third party desire um and then they they're hooked uh, after mm -hmm. that right and, and sell it to the british people because they're an island and that would like very <laughs> close to them. like think like a brit think like an island <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i, I like gotta... that i like the fact uh, that people can like also could exchange maps and you know uh, maybe through time tend to Converge to uh, a, a common map. I don't know. I find the, the idea. Use back your archipelago or like yeah. know, an actual globe. You know, at the end you have a whole Earth, a little yeah. planet. <laughs> yeah, this will be so, really yeah. interesting. Thank you, Diana, for joining. I, I I know that you need to leave, but thank you. So yes, it was really really fun to talk about the the yeah. island again. It's been a while. I mean, you know, I was. Yeah. Off for doing the whole alphabet than just to, to see it through. I was happy with it. I liked it. Uh, and we could have discovered more. So it would be interesting yes, to bring the island and let's play again. What can we yeah. do? How would Maybe our we can island change the rules? Attack? Maybe we can change yeah. the rules. I, I, I'm, I'm sure if we if we provide each participant with some rules, some basic rules on how to use the different ties and, and then let them map and then at the end, we... Okay, so, so here's okay. what I want to do with the map next time when yes. I bring it. I want everyone to, like, build their own center of a map. And then we can meet in whichever way we want in the middle. Mm. But, like, to, to have our own ways of, uh, you know, interacting with our own map and whatever we want to say. Mm. Uh, 
and it, it doesn't have to always be words. If we can actually create our own visual appealing map and then fill it in and help each other out, but like start from different cardinal points and kind of meet meet at some point. I think this we didn't do. We kind of you know we were very modular, <laughs> but that yeah, didn't but really we were help. modular and centralized. We had the same starting point. We had the same. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and I think that the yeah. island is not, yeah, to create that diversity, I think we need to have more of ourselves into it, so to let ourselves mm -hmm. create, like we were drawing, you know, the way we draw, uh, yes, the yes. design way, <laughs> so, yes, exactly. like that. yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, yeah, let's, so let's, do, let's try it out, maybe we'll after try that. <laughs> you know, we do the community workshop with us, we can yes. book another uh, session with the island, yeah, I'd like that, definitely. Well, yeah. thanks so much, guys. Thank uh, you. I'll leave you. I'm hungry. That's what's yeah. going on. It's late. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining. Take care, guys. Take yeah. care. <laughs> so, um, we can go for like 10 more minutes if, if you're fine. Um, if... Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, whatever's on your mind. I don't know. <laughs> What? So how, 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 are, how do you guys usually conduct uh, the virtual chalets? Well, it's it's exactly like this one. You know, okay. it's like it's pretty organic. We like you know be, when before you came, uh, we were discussing about tools. So it was like a, a natural transition to to the topic, and, and and you you play the game with us, so that's really nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, usually it's really it's really organic. Uh, we try to have more, sometimes more structured uh, workshops or uh, sessions when we do the workshops, because we then we we you know we bring some rules, some some yeah some guiding guiding principles for 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 the exercise. But usually, I like the fact that we have uh, an you know um, informal discussions uh, that we can you know navigate through topics and come back to uh, the original topic or maybe go to a, a totally different place. So that's how it goes. Yeah, so one of the things that I'm trying to explore is how how people um, uh, use their resources or how people view their resources mm. um, uh, depending on I guess different different cultural con I, I I wouldn't even call it different cultural contexts, but just different um, uh, contexts of uh, how uh, how what if you were in a different situation a and in a very specific way. So, like one of the things that um, you know, like like the the, the typical. Uh, analogy is like what happens if you trade places with like a billionaire or something like that like how would you live your life well then it's like oh that's a little bit too abstract right because that's kind of like saying you once you trade places with a billionaire then immediately you think oh you have like an in, instant infusion of like a huge amount of like infinite wealth or whatever and you could do whatever i i, I would actually like to see the gradient you know as you move along um of, of how people would yeah. behave differently like the real question isn't how you would behave as a billionaire but how how on each step step one step two as you're getting there or you know as your bank account your asset amount your liability amount like if each of these numbers were concrete how would you rationally you know change your behavior right on yes. in each day and each of those like like this type of questionnaire um and the ability of this to kind of explore your i guess idea of responsibility right helps inform you of uh, yeah. of, of what are the challenges and what are the limits mm -hmm. yeah the, the, like before i really like go in the same direction that you like i, I one of the issues I, I, I see with that kind of questions is because it's hypothetical, um, you have a, 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 a like a loss of constraints, right? Because it it feels like uh, it's so different from what you know that 
in some sense everything is possible right and especially with this specific example which is voluntarily you know um feels like an exciting thing like to be right you, you could ask the same question with the sort of opposite like what would be for you to be like uh, i don't know the poorest person in the world in the poorest country of the world uh, where you don't you have barely access to water and and food and it's the same like it feels like it, it's a total loss of, of constraints for 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 you to be able to actually think of that right and what i find interesting here is like because any people thinking about this situation would not be able to figure out what would be then the new constraints because it's it's not tr it's not real for you right it's 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 um oh i lost you you're still here i i agree yeah so oh. i guess what i was really trying to get at wasn't to um I mean, it's really just an education, it's, a, yeah. it's an exploration and education method yes. of um, inquiring deeply about uh, if you were given a, a real, like, it's not an essentialism question, it's the existential question, which is mm -hmm. when you're thrown into a situation of, uh, of actual amounts that you are dealing with, that you're managing a household of like six or seven, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so on and so forth there are constraints of your time and then you have to really budget it differently now it doesn't really even have to be a, really a questionnaire of depth because you can you can already go into surveys and see how families and how everything is done right like there is real world data of uh of these situations of these people yes. of different profiles of different countries of the poorest, of the richest, you would have that whole dynamic platform out there. The, the real question, of course, is, you know, what are your expectations of yourself and how you see yourself in the dynamic situation? Mm -hmm. um, because it is dynamic, right? As yes. long as so long as you believe that that mobility is there and you can act accordingly, right? Yeah, but that, then it has to become some form of experiential thing as well, because right yeah. Yeah. You, you need to live it through yeah. you like to build the expectations you require like if we go you know it's, it's it's exactly the same kind of discussion we had so far right it's uh it relates to your capacity of sensing the um, the terrain right to, to 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 have a sense of the terrain and where you know like you have an intuition of what, what are the barriers because even if you are like the richest person in the, in the world you will still have like some barriers. You could not do everything that you but that comes in your mind, right? So, so setting the expectations, like because I, I find it interesting as an introspection and education way, as you as you mentioned, if it has some sense of discoverability, uh, just for your just for uh, for for yourself uh, as a, you know as a starting point, then it would be interesting to set some non-realistic uh, you know uh, expectations that the one that you can come up right away as as you think about this situation and then you know experiencing like some kind of um mini game mini scenario where you are you know you land in the shoes you land in you land in the shoes of a, a billionaire and we set some rules of how it could work you know like some basic rules that you don't have to simulate the the, the entire reality of, of it but some aspects of it like some that are that feel tangible enough for 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 it to be to be meaningful right and you could say now we experience it now you you have you have sometimes to retrospect on what happened and what was your expectation at the beginning and what was your expectation as you as you explored actually the the real landscape even if it's a fake one in the you know a temporary fake one in the in the game uh itself uh still you have some constraints it's exactly the same when you you play some games like civilization or you know or sim city and stuff like that um uh you 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 feel the power that you have but you also feel the how powerless you are about many other things right uh, and this tension yeah. still exists, whether you are you are like in a good mood you or, or not, right? So, so uh, yeah, you 
have you seen the movie uh being john malkovich um it's no. uh starring john malkovich but yeah anyways i would um, like to say it's uh now you mentioned it uh this is a, a movie i would uh, i wanted to 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 see I, I never did so yeah well yeah i mean if you if you ever do um i think it it is quite, quite valuable in terms of um uh, exactly to your point about the difference between experiential and what is actually lacking if you view yourself as a tourist versus a mm. permanent resident, right, of, of that experience. And being, being a tourist, um, you lack this, um, you lack this responsibility, but at the mm. same time, it is liberating because uh, without that responsibility, you have no uh, this this expectation of no limits and so then you take more risks and as being a yeah. more a bigger risk taker grants you a superpower of a different sense mm -hmm. um, i would say that in most cases it's actually more important to have the soup the ability to be a billionaire versus being a billionaire because mm -hmm. having the ability to be a billionaire you know says that there is intangible intrinsic value of i don't know what it is like out capital allocation or, or reputation or something mm -hmm. where you have this kind of competence right and and in, in a way it makes it so that money is not the primary you know goal uh, or primary um status symbol but really mm -hmm. it's it's a more intangible reputation uh, value yeah, right yeah and yeah so that's something that is worth exploring is um you know it, in my opinion it is far better to be a good investor than it is to be you know a, 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 an investor with you know xxxxxxx digits right of, <laughs> of net worth right being a good investor means you can tap into the markets at any time and uh exercise good decision and good you know investment strategies so that you can achieve that right uh, yeah. yeah yeah you know yeah that that's funny that, that there's two things i uh two one movie and one tv show i uh this makes me think of the the one i don't remember the name in english i, I know the name in french but not in english the title of the movie it's a you know it's it with jim carrey and he uh he becomes god for like a few days and um and i love this movie because well, obviously it's funny but but it's not that it's it's the it's be beyond the um, the humor that is used as a device to you know to subvert your expectations uh is this idea of uh of learning something right that's uh we like in a sense uh, that uh, yeah you know this idea of uh the grass is always greener on the, you know, on the neighbor's uh, uh, side and, and stuff like that. But, but I, I, you know, it plays with this idea of um, of uh, being in this game, and 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 for like few days, you you have all the power that you you could imagine. Of. Um, then then you you see in the movie, even if it if given the standards of uh, Christianity, it makes no sense that God has, you know, that this. Uh, there's these consequences to what gods do because God sees everything and therefore it just like makes no sense. Yeah, Please, omniscient, it yeah, cannot be. There, there cannot I, be any any issue with any decision, right? But in so that I sense, I remember the, the yeah. whole like email scene, right, where he was answering the emails. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> and then the fact that he granted like uh, wishes to anyone, like any priors right. was was granted uh, with, without any discriminations. Like I want to be taller and. Suddenly, the guy was turned. I, I want this this uh, cup of water to be to be turned in wine, and everything turns in wine. You know, and it, it's like it, it sounds so meaningless for God to you know to to wish that kind of uh, to 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 grant that that kind of wishes, and uh, at the same time, he does exactly what he believes that someone is in his position should be able to do, right? And he faced the extent of that decision. He faced the consequences of those decisions that the world is just, uh, you know, falling apart because everything is now really possible because anything is granted because this is what he believes a God should, should do, right? 
And you know, again, with given Christianity and God as we understand it as in this religion, it makes no sense, right? But as a, a thought experiment, it's 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 interesting, like from a human perspective at least, it's interesting, right? And um, and this is the experiential part of of the the exercise of of power, is that uh, it it has a counterbalance. It, it necessitates um, it necessitates actually. Um, um, consequences to to have any sense to have any meaning right and in that in that direction it is this is funny that now I'm discussing that I realize that this this movie is less about uh, a Christian God than it is about consequentialism but that, that's, <laughs> that's a funny uh, note uh, and the, the other t the other thing is the TV show uh, I don't know if you you follow the Orville uh, it's about the Orville the oven no Orville, I think it's called Or. Oh, it, I, I, maybe I'm mispronouncing it, but uh, it's it's um, it's a TV show that uh, emulates the Star Trek, uh, I you know the, the Star Trek uh, idealism of uh, you know a future society that has no no um, uh, no monetary system anymore and that moves beyond that kind of uh, you know uh, struggles and now. You know, is devoted to explore the, the universe and stuff like that, and, and that's funny because in one of the recent episodes, they explored the idea that someone coming from a society like like ours uh, suddenly was uh, being put in this this society, this idealistic society, and lost totally lost any uh, marks. You know, it was she was this person was unable to to make decision. And was only seeing the gap between where she she was coming from and the new the new reality, right? And what they, they wanted to do is taking that, that what allowed this technology, this uh, society to exist as it is, like all the technology, and bring it back to to her society so she can make it better. And the whole point was that any intervention of that scale uh, would not guarantee. Uh, to end as the, this futuristic society, that it will pro most probably create chaos and destroy the society, than rather than raising uh, raising it to the bar of this uh, you know futuristic ideal society, which is uh, the the which is the the one in the in the TV show, and I find it interesting because now you just don't you are not just uh, you know um, brought it to like, like as you mentioned, this tourist or he, she, she was a guest in that sense, right? And she became more than a guest; she became entirely part of a society, and she could not rec recognize it as soon as she transitioned from a guest to uh, an active member, because because the implications was different, right? The the and and I find it interesting. I'm not saying it, it brings any like grand, uh, you know. Uh, a conclusion and then meaning for, for what we are no, saying. No, I, I think I think it is somewhat of a grand idea that experiences actually can transform and create a seed within you where you can actually take that seed and as it grows within you, take that experience into most of your everyday interactions, right? <laughs> um, so kind of like the whole idea behind transforming uh, from being a guest into a permanent resident, this is a hero myth um, mm -hmm. of Avatar, right? Or <laughs> of Dances with Wolves, the whole yes. concept of like, once you are um, cultured with the indigenous population, you see it from their perspective. So that, that authentic experience from a different culture gives you kind of like a visa from being a guest, right? You're not a tourist anymore, but you're actually uh, responsible as their own, right? And then you have to make decisions as their own. And this, yeah. I guess, yeah, I, I think that part is somewhat, um, you know, elucidating and it has some, some you know, perpetual value, right? Yeah. Uh, especially, um, you know, and, and I, I, I think another thing about monetary systems in general is I, I view monetary systems as just a one variable maximization, 
uh, network, right? So uh, if we were to like create a network, create any kind of you know monetary system, and we have one variable or you know one thing you want to maximize, which is efficiency, then mm-hmm. then the U.S. dollar would be it, right? And then you know the experiment that we've had since uh, you know after World War uh, to uh, Bretton Woods, you know, U.S. being central um, uh, reserve currency. That's that's the experiment that has been r- ran for seventy years. And um, you know, the the uh, I guess you could say that there are two competing aspects of var- like two competing variables that are out there because C- mm-hmm. there's there's the three right the three main ones: people, planet, profit. And and we've been focusing on profit, but this this People and, and, and people. planet thing, and people. right? There, Big people. <laughs> well, so people uh, is a Marxist idea, right? Mm-hmm. It's the whole idea that you want to uh, solve the self alienation problem by giving people the ability to do what they want and actually own what they do, right? But but it only kind of works for the select few who are like actual creators and not not you know the uneducated. So, so in some ways, he kind of concedes, right, that uh, intellectually, that capitalism is probably a better system for the majority. But, but mm. the problem is also that you kind of cr- you kind of destroy the creation, um, the creator, you know, ecosystem, because industrial, you know, capitalism kind of like destroys the the yeah. market for individual creators, yeah. right? Like it's really hard to. To, to, to market, you know, individual. And, and currently, that, that's interesting because I'm currently exploring the, the the whole notion of degrowth, you know, as a as a as an approach to to economy. And how do you like degrowth? Like, you know, have you have you read the the, the Club of Rome's, you know, the whole thing and all that stuff? No, I, I, like I, I like I encountered the the concept several times. I, I'm not sure having. I'm not. I I, I did not read uh, any book on that yet. I'm exploring like by pieces, you know. I find it at the beginning. I was like really skeptical of because it was it was not presented. It was not presented as something on itself, but it was presented as an opposition to the current thing, you know. And I feel like th- this was lacking any, like you know, is uh, is out. Uh, Prime, you need to be to go beyond just a statement of what it is because you cannot, from what it is, assert any odd. You know, this is not because uh, things are going wrong right now that you can say we ought to do something different. You you need something more to justify the necessity of of this different thing. And this is where I was really lacking. My understanding was really lacking any meaningful way to see how it could be a real alternative. On itself, just not as an opposition to the current problems, you know. Now I'm seeing that because people worked on the idea more than just a statement of what it, what is not working. Because it's interesting, it kind of has an evolution, uh, uh, you know, throughout time as a as a concept. And uh, I'm following just uh, recently. I was watching a video from Timothée Parik, which is a French guy living in, I think it's Sweden, uh, on Finland. I don't remember. Uh, and he's working as a, a researcher. Uh, he's an economist, and he did all his entire thesis on degrowth and all the history behind. And he was talking about that in a video recently, and I find it really interesting. And now, and as a con- you know, as a construct, I find it really way way better way better defined as uh, as a, as an idea that that can actually works. I, I, you know, I like this. Now, after watching the video, I came with this uh, metaphor of what it could be if we use not, uh, we don't use like economic uh, statement or economic, uh, you know, language to describe it. For me, it's, uh, oh, <laughs> we just lost you. Oh, yeah. I just lost, lost you for a bit. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, yeah so, I just lost you for a bit. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. My uh, internet was spotty. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, if we don't use if we don't use the the language of economic, we could use the energy as a as a, a good um, you know um, metaphor and say 
uh, if we had like this amount of energy, which is finite, right? Uh, yeah. We had to pick, we have to decide how to allocate it. But then as soon as you talk about energy, then it becomes less a binary choice, right? It's not either industry or, you know, or the planet or, you know, saving the, 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 the collapse of the ecosystems and stuff, stuff like that, right? It becomes like a, a more rational choice of where you put some energy. Then you have a quantity which is finite, but you don't know exactly how much it is, right? This is where, where, where it's weird. Uh, but it's finite and you decide to allocate some energy there and some energy there and, and then the, the entirety of your energy is still there. It's just diffused in different ways, right? And today where it's diffused is a narrow space where it takes all the, the you know, all the, the, the energy is it's located, you know, uh, neatly in, in one, in one space. And, you know, in, in most European countries, um, there's some contradiction in the culture of how we perceive what is a public institution and what all the last recent, uh, we'll say, um, last recent um, um, economic choices was made by by the countries, like in France, for instance, where public services are like a, a, a given fact, like it's it's something that any citizen has some basic rights upon what the the government should provide to them, right? And it's really like as an idea. It's it's it, of course it it is from you know universal uh, universal form of universalism and a form of uh, of um, understanding of human rights and, and stuff like that. So it it's really grounded into old philosophy of what is a government and how it should serve citizens and how it should serve people, right? But then on top of that, you have this layer of you know we need to be a country that's that is good at economic, that we need to be a, a good performing country in, term, in terms of economic. We need to be, like the comparison is always with, with the United States, right? You, like the, the, so for so far, French people were like, you know, crying about the fact that uh, basically that uh, we didn't have like this state up, uh, you know, um, uh, like um, Silicon Valley equivalent in France or in Europe. Uh, but we never really asked the question, should we really care? Should we really care of that, you know, as a, an energy allocation? It's, it's, it, in fact, it makes less right. sense than as a, just an economic uh, statement, right? So, it, so I, you know, now you have like this prioritization of profit of, a, of a, uh, this notion of, of uh, basic rights for, for citizens. Now we are, we are asking public institutions to, to, to be efficient, what's the point, right? We can really ask the question, do we want uh, public institutions to be efficient in terms of, uh, you know, how how it makes money, how it costs less? Like, you know, it, it, it's a real question and we'd never ask it this, this way because we have to see it as a, a performing um, organism as a company, right? Which, which is, yeah contradictory in this sense, right? Well, I mean, the reason why we have institutions in the first place is because market coordination alone doesn't do the complete job and yes. service, right? And, and it doesn't provide what the society really wants. Um, we have history to kind of tell us why. Um, so some institutions are power institutions that are just structured in a way to retain power and in some cases they do not really serve the use of the people so you know in in french history you yeah. can say that the Agreed. french monarchy yeah correct yeah. and the only way to kind of grow out of that to have this effective huge dismantling of that institution but also kind of incorporating some of the regalism of monarchy into the kind of like the executive branch of the of the of, of basically king some of the art of it right um because there is some you know there's some residual value of having this institution of leadership mm. uh e even if it is you know symbolic in a way and and in much in much cases um e efficiency is something that is real and you can use accounting and you know 
balance sheet to represent that and can be something of, of, of a comparable nature. And it's something that is fungible, right? Fungible as in like, you can trade it, you can trade, you can transport dollars across seas. It is, you know, it is fungible, right? And fungible, it, fungibility is, um, uh, you know, actually a unique qualitative thing that you have with money that you do not have with people or planet. All right. And, and that alone is one reason why I would say maybe the monetary system should continue to exist and we just destroy our environment or, or we find <laughs> you know, ways to tax it. Right. We try to like internalize the externalities by using taxation, but, right? By using but we already bargaining. tried. No. We know what 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 fake constra constraints do, do. You know, we, we we can see it. Like recent examples uh, shows how fake. For instance, um, there's some good example with some products that entertains a fake uh, notion of um, scarcity. Uh, that's that's that, like take take the multiverse, take what, what it sells parcels of pixels in a digital world where you can have like an infinite number of pixels if you would like to, right? That there's no right. meaning into having constraints of space in a virtual world. But, but we apply this logic and it's a fake one. It creates fake, fake scarcity. And because it's virtual and it's, you know, because it's virtual and has no grounding into reality, then, then there's high volatility that you cannot have really at the same scale and at, with the same power of magnitude than you have with like a real monetary system, like a fiat money, you know, like, like paper that ha needs to be printed to be used, that there's a, there's a tangible thing that attached the, you know, the virtual value is attached to something that is physical and that's, that is grounded into reality. And that makes that it, it has some physical limits to it. Right. And it works then because, because it has some physical limits. It doesn't work when it's the limits are as virtual as the space it lives in. And well, I want to be wrong on that, frankly. But from what I, I seen, like with Web3, like with uh, NFTs, with uh, cryptocurrencies, that um, all the fake constraints that are put in, they 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 are detached from reality, right? And uh, like the right. like this, the whole notion of proof of work is a fake constraint. That's that's had some real repercussions on you know on energy consumption of of uh, you know buildings built only for the purpose of mining uh mining cryptocurrencies and stuff like that uh, with heavy power uh powered um uh, computers that can do the job of of doing what was required by the the, the fake constraints that we created right now we are moving a bit away of that but just to give you an example where where, where we see it, it like it works only if the repercussion of the real world had impacts on the use of the actual, you know, use of the money, which is not the case here. Like you could buy with, with cryptocurrency, you can buy, you know, virtual stuff with virtual money, with virtual constraints. Then, you know, where, where exactly is the, is the, is the limit? So it's just, it's just to say that I agree. I don't, I don't know if I agree with the statement that we should keep monetary system as such, because you could replace it with something else that works as, as good and would be would be another way to like maybe a, a way that is that represents even more the um, the intricacies of our interactions. Hey, Anvesh. <laughs> hey, um, well, so I mean, I wanted to just preface first off that the reason why I think the monetary system might still continue to exist and just have a different you know, feature, right? Update feature uh, is, is again, due to that property of, um, uh, of it being fungible. Because one of the things about uh, this whole people, the, the, the other two P's, the, the people and the planet, is that they are way too qualitative uh, for you to even invoke a comparison. And, and 
even the notion of trying to quantify it, you have such a huge transaction cost. Like, have you ever been to court and tried to like see grievances, try to be quantified? Like they want everything uh, in, in the courtroom when there's, you know, a lawsuit, right? They, they want everything. And they, 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 they even lie, they even lie through their teeth to talk about how much they're in pain that they are. And, and we know that this is embellishment. We know, so, you know, everything that you don't like about efficiency, it is wrapped up in qualitative, um, you know, uh, things like that. And, mm-hmm. and so fungibility is a virtue. Um, now, I agree with the whole idea that uh, a lot of these, you know, blockchain technologies, they have, they're, they're constrained mostly in this way where they, they try to be uh, a, a replacement of the monetary system rather than being a complementary uh, add-on. And, and in so doing, they, they run the very huge risk of if they cannot scale, it, even in their marketing, in, in their message, if they just do not have the adoption rate, then they fail. So this is a complete binary um, you know, uh, 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 point of failure. It's a binary, easy, very low probability. Yeah. Um, but there's, uh, a, there's uh, other, uh, other layers to that, I think, like, that is bankrupt in this, is this idea that cryptocurrencies are a replacement to, to money is that they are not money, they are assets, and they are treated as such, right? You own them just because it has some, it has some value to other people, no, not intrinsically, but to other people, right? And yeah. which is not the same thing with, with fiat money, for instance. It's not true, it's true to some extent, but it's not as true as it is for cryptocurrencies. And so it's, it's, it's less treated as a, as a device for exchange, like a, a transactional device, and more like as something to own and, and to, to keep. Like if you take, for instance, like your bank and you ask for a credit to your bank, the money is created for you, for your, the use, like it's actually, it's, it's truly actually created for you, for the use of what you will, will do with it. To be injected into the system by you using it, and then being destroyed as soon as it is used. Like it's, it is actually the case that when you use your money, it is destroyed because as soon as it comes back to a bank, by any means, by any way, it is destroyed. The money does not exist anymore. And it is meant to be that way just, just, to, just because it is a utility stuff. It's, it's, not, it's not an asset. It's not something like your, your house, your computer, you're, you know, right. That's that's why it's called liquidity, right? Yeah, it's just, exactly. It's just the ability to flow and not the actual amount of water. Exactly. And and um and so that's why it's more about the velocity of money versus money itself. Uh, but you know, there's also the notion that you know something like the U.S. dollar operates a little bit differently than you a commercial bank, right? It, it, yes. is a, it is a reserve currency. And so therefore it's, it is not effectively destroyed when something is used. There is just- Yeah, it's not the same. Of, it's not the same money actually, but I agree. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, true. So, so there is just this perpetual inflationary principle behind it. Yeah. And you know, one of the arguments, and this is really just a marketing tool of blockchain is that yeah. they are always printing and devaluing your currency. and. On, on some levels, that is true. And so if you, if you don't want to be negatively taxed by inflation, then yeah, sure, adopt crypto. But, but that's just the no, marketing but, flow of it, right? But, that's just but, the it's, not, but it, it's not even true. Like, it, it, it's, not, it's not actually true. Like, when, when money is, is printed, like, money is injected into systems. Like, today, we cannot say it, it, it's, a, it's a statement of fact that monetary system and the economic system as a whole is uh, artificially maintained to keep its, its status, which is, we can discuss well, yeah, so, the, uh, so, so, so money is inj- money is injected when there is a loan that is written, exactly. right? Like, so a company or, exactly. you know, a person wants to build a house. And, and, that's, that's and the, economic, the economic aspect, the value that is created is not the money itself, it's the use of the money. So because we, we don't care of the money itself, but we, we care about how it is used, how, how it serves the economy. 
And then the GDP, for instance, is just a, a measure. This is what Timothy Parikh was explaining his, in his uh, video about degrowth, that the GDP is just um, a, a metric of agitation of a country, of how many, how many times money flows, how many transactions there is, right? It doesn't change anything about the real uh, economic values of the assets. It just yeah. means the transactions of... I stuff. mean, that's why we have all of these GDP derivative metrics, right? Like GDP exactly. parity and stuff like purchase power parity. Um, and, and, you know, in some ways, it's like comparing two different countries' army size with one yes. another. Like one, one, one country might actually have greater technology, so you should assign a multiple like a greater multiple onto their yes. uh, army size versus the yeah. other army size, right? So you're not comparing army size. You're, co you're comparing um, the military capabilities, yeah. so to and, speak, and, right? Yeah. yeah, and if you had to guess what, you know, uh, if the Russian will, was going against the, the U.S., you could say, oh, well, the U.S. has a greater military infrastructure, more modern, more efficient, blah, 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 whatever. But then the, the, the Russian knows how to use their capacities in, in different ways. And it, it would be not an argument about how much technology they hold. Uh, like, it's not a, a good uh, metric of the, the, like the quality of the army in, in that sense. I'm not... I'm not <laughs> they yeah, are, I mean, just Russian, Russian same. actors are far more capable than, you know, our, our CIA, right? Yeah, but, exactly. But, and that's but, the point of money. It's the same point of, 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 of money and how we measure uh, economic values and stuff like that in, in, in that sense. And this is exactly where um, I'm going with, with cryptocurrencies. And it's, it's, a, it's a bankrupt idea to imagine, like, as a replacement of, of actual money. Is, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it's I, I it's a it's purely a... unified system. It's it has no diversity in, in use and interactions. It's it's contained in a virtual now, world. Now, now, and what they so many things to but but the value destroy. that they do create it does organize communities around a single issue. Yes, and in, in and it's not different than um, like if we were to say we create a community and we create a money a monetary system just for us. Like a small scale, uh, local, local stuff that works for us. Now the, the yeah. issue with cryptocurrencies is that they want to scale that to the entire planet. Correct. Right? And, Which and makes no I, sense because it works locally, but but then as it ends, it is. It's a single point of failure that has yeah. a high probability of failure. Yeah. 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 And this is this is where it, it makes sense as a community based um, system, where where but it, it but again. For the meaning of the well, for the value, the value is, is a form of meaning of what what is this 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 uh, money that we use. Uh, it has to be grounded into like some some localities, like right. So yeah, um, yeah, some it's local like, use like of it. Go, when you go to amusement park and you trade in your actual euros for just like the tickets, right? Coins and, or and for coins to, to, to use in it has to, it's like, it's, it has to be yeah. temporary and it has to be spatially confined and it yeah. has to be. Purely a game, an experimental, um, or or just really just a transaction, you know, uh, yeah. feature, right? Um, and, and you could say you could say that um, you could say that um, um, like if we don't have this and we say we stay at the local uh, space, we could we could uh, remove the devices and still keep the transaction and still keep the value, right? We could remove money and use words to agree on something. And that right. those those agreements, like uh, like a uh, um, like a temporary informal contract between the two of us, like we agree on a transaction of of services or I don't know what. Like let's say we are farmers and we are all a community of farmers, and I say I have some carrots and you have some oh, yeah. uh, some eggs, and we exchange the two. That there's no money involved, but there's so, the transaction, right? Ah, oh, that's you. <laughs> I don't see you guys. <laughs> Sorry. Well, so kind of like in the olden days, right? Um, yeah. Of, of farm, farmers and communes. It's, it's kind of like you don't actually know the yield. You know, truly, as speaking as a farmer, you don't know the real yield of your crops. You don't know the yield of like how much milk that your cows are actually going to produce. There's a lot of uncertainty and the volatility is inherent within the nature of the job. And so therefore, um, uh, you want an insurance company that helps insure cash flow for your business, right? But 
if it doesn't exist, then the only way to do it is by taking advantage of the law of law, law, law of large numbers. So you try to commune with you know your other farmer neighbors and what whatever, and you share. You share whatever the yield is, and that is a handshake, right? Yes. That is not one that is based upon a contractual output quota, right? So it's one that is. So so again, once you leave the quantitative world, then you you no longer have mon money in, anymore. You, you have basically a call option uh, with like a very works, low strike price. Th that works at local level because yeah. the because the I would say the state of intrication of like the state of complexity on itself is is quite low. It's manageable for for our brains, right? It's 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 totally hand, it's it's totally manageable and. The thing is that at a, a small scale level, um, it, it would be a better allocation tool as an energy output. Like if you say uh, economy is a form of energy, right, and you have to manage it in, in a certain way, to be in a community and say we don't have like uh, we don't have tokens of the energy, but we see the energy as we discuss about what is possible in between us, right? And we discuss on how we allocate it. At a local state, it makes more sense than again just at a local state. It makes more sense right. than a quantitative asset that represents the value of uh, you know some monetary abstract that then be will be apl applied at a local a local level. And this is where you you can say that there's different level of abstraction of what is an economic an economic system. I'm 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 not inventing anything here because it's so, so, things that you can read at uh, in many in many books and, and and papers. But just saying that you know, back in the days uh, and still today, there's some communities that do that that they 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 no longer exist as individuals, but as a community is a form of uh, you know entity that can then trade on more international markets, but. At a local level, they don't need the use of the money itself. It's just a means for them to, to, you know, to trade outside of the community. You know, you see what I mean. And it's exactly what what does like many like um, what is the name the name for for this kind of uh, community based on around cryptocurrencies and stuff like that is um, uh, well, the DAOs. Yes, thank you, DAOs. Um, yes. Yeah, DAOs. Uh, the idea oh. is. Is uh is to is to use something Wait, at a small scale, right. and it's yes, it, there's a governance at, at small scale, and then then the the community as it is governed can ex, ex, exchange uh, things with other communities, and it works well from a, a community like perspective, in between communities perspective, because because then it, it makes sense, right? You, but then it it begs a question, like. Is that just isn't it just a form of cooperation, right? Because because you know this is this is what corporations was uh, where in like a, like way back in the in the time where where it was the form of uh, of communities. Like it, it was literally there were cities built for communities that were working in the same place, right? For the same kind of uh, and and then all the economy uh, economic um, uh, system in this community was uh, was not real money. It was uh, it was uh, uh, you know coins and stuff like that that were used only locally, uh, and then the corporation acts as um, you know as um, as an entity that has more leverage toward the like for for instance the government or other other co co corporations to buy stuff outside of the co of the community, which which made sense back then. Um, then it was used for industrial stuff, and then it changed and mutated. But just to say, I'm not saying that it was better in the past. Just to say that there's a different form of economic systems and monetary system that they, that existed and still exist today. That that seems to be ignored when you talk about economy as uh, as a whole thing, right? Um, well, I, I definitely see the parallels. Of that, this was probably a pre-Dutch cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, once you get into like the Dutch innovation of a public company, then it becomes not just about debt uh, creation and 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 that kind of liquidity, but you're you're actually talking about like equity fundraising, right? Yes. So so you pool a bunch of owners together 
and then they they can together buy a huge uh, ship or many mm-hmm. many ships, and it's all pulled together in like a, a, a type of shared um, asset uh, pool, right? Yeah, and and then you do the trading and get the spices and whatnot. It's a form of crowd crowdsourcing or crowd sharing yeah, yeah, in, a, yeah. in a sense. Right. And 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 you can speculate on the total like you know uh, lifetime cash flow of mm-hmm. or value of these assets as they operate, right? And 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 slowly um, they're incentivized to reduce the risk of the operations over time, and so and so you have good managerial um, uh, uh, practices. Um, that are, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, basically you, you employ um, uh, human talent uh, to problem. Because, I mean, the whole, the whole notion of value creation is to create a problem and then solve it and then you create value, <laughs> right? But you first have to create problems. If you don't create problems, um, then, then you're not creating value. And what if you don't have any problems? You make problems up. <laughs> you know, you create desire. You have to create... Yeah. So problems is a negative form of desire, right? Which is you have a, you have a desire to take away the pain of a consumer or of a, of, of, a, of a firm or something like that. And so, yeah, you, you look for problems because you, sometimes you cannot satisfy desire, right? Like we have, we have sometimes unobtainable desires, the desire to be like God or to, you know, live forever or to be beautiful or to be desired, right? By others. Yeah. That's these are desires that are unfulfillable, and so what do we look for? We look for problems. So what? What if I, you know, I don't look good? Then cosmetically, there's makeup and all that stuff, and surgery and all that stuff to to, to, to offer and fix your problems. So yeah, like fixing, like you know, there's there's another notion of this, which is that there's um, there's an unhealthy obsession with searching for problems right yeah, like right. We're, we're problem searchers more than we're, we are problem solvers especially mm. the more upstream you are in marketing you're actually like there's not enough problems out there so let me just create some right and then <laughs> and then this is this is actually one of the things where um marketers actually create disinformation and you misinformation don't, problems you don't think because you don't need to be a, a marketing guy to, to, to do that, right? Like, just check check what technology, like, like, um, like startups in the Silicon Valley is doing, right? With technologies, is creating something and expecting from for for solving problems that does does not exist anymore uh, yet. Sorry, and then then the fact that the the solution exists is. Um, is um is um self realization uh you know uh, of the of the of the problem that it tends to to that it would like to to solve that like the fact that solution exist the solution exists for something that does not really exist creates the the, the circumstances for the problem for to exist you know there, there's some kind of uh, of uh, a weird uh, it's not really like a, a, a paradox but it's a, it's a weird uh, thing right it's uh like well I, I was actually discussing this earlier uh yesterday with uh with a friend of mine and we he, he came up with a really nice construct which is that um within every problem there is uh the villain the victim and a hero right but mm-hmm. in particular uh industries you know like especially when you talk about big tech right silicon valley google amazons they they construct worlds they construct universes that you live in you know so you're just a guest in their universe you're you you, you've you've immigrated you got a passport and you have you're powerless they are a monopoly and so they are both the villain they're the villain but they are also the hero so they create their own problems by being it's, the villain, it's and like then they the, create the solutions. It's of, like the fire. God. Yeah, well, I mean, they're effectively so, playing God because of the market structure that mm. they have, right? If you are a monopoly, you can create your own problems, you can be the villain, be the hero, yeah. and and as a victim, you are not aware of this power play against you, so you are perpetually trapped. No, exactly and- why I think uh, 
lot of people are so curious about uh, blockchain technology because it's just uh, it's opposite of centralization right that's what is holding lot of people how to decentralize in a way where the power is not monopolized <laughs> so one thing is so they are creating universe because they have lot of money and why do they have lot of money because they have lot of data to process and make sense of data and why are they hold so much data because that's how it's designed they, they have a monopoly of data thing so it's our data which they hold and they play the fed so if if there is decentralization of data decentralization of data if you own your own data and you give the consent wherever it's required sometimes uh, they ask more than which is required for that particular transaction the, like the forms are designed in such way uh, there are like lot of engineers designers anthropologists social scientists to design such way that we without even thinking give so much information and that helps them to make so much things right yeah. so the entire point of blockchain at least what's holding lot of people is that now that's not going to happen if anybody is creating digital identities which would let you it's like a passport where you can go anywhere only where you want to go nobody can push you from behind or pull you from ahead in this virtual world and now that uh, there are a lot of people who are working uh, to build better bridges between digital and physical universe and some maybe later it would be so effortless that we don't we cannot even discern it then at that time having a, a personal identity with all uh, our it's like an uh, certificate it's like resume eulogy uh, your skills your soft skills your character virtues your sexual orientation your preferences your kinks everything would be under one personal identity and this is all it about you uh, it might there might be more but this is something uh, a semblance of you which you hold together and this is what they have now and they can play with it in a way different people that's why uh, the key collection whatever it's happening you don't even know if i'm working on facebook but somebody else is sharing the ads so they are uh, consciously like they have their own network where uh, we give them consent to share with everything uh, so they are already doing it and there are a lot of uh, internet freedom guys who what do you call who are fighting against it i guess Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we're, we're well aware of the problem, and I think、um, that's why I didn't want to discuss the problem. I just wanted <laughs> to say that there's the construct of the villain hero, and that they put、yeah. both sides, so you don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> no, why, why I'm even sharing this is because、uh, at the end I feel、uh, if we understand at what level they are playing, like this is all layers. They hold data. If we give an.、Uh, Great structure. You can hold your data. Then、uh, I think it is the solution, and blockchain is the closest thing which gives you that opportunity. Yeah, but I tend to disagree strongly with that statement.、Uh, that's not against you and Vish, but with the statement that is made by people believing in in in、um, in、uh, in web free technology, and especially on on that specific idea of decentralization. It's like it's missing the point. It's totally missing the point, because then you can ask the question: Who decentralizes the people who created the system? And how do you decentralize how the data is stored? And how do you then you go in the infinite loop of you know of regression where you need to decentralize absolutely anything for it to work? Like it's it's an absolutism idea that cannot work in real world because you will have. An intrication of layers that will be part of the system of decentralization, and parts with, 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 which cannot be in that system. For instance, a good example, recent, quite recent example, like、um, in、um, uh, at the beginning of the NFT crisis,、uh, you had in、uh, I think it's Pakistan. I'm not sure. Uh, people that bought a lot of buildings where they 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 put it farms of computers to mine to mine crypto and stuff like that. As soon as the market crashed, these people had a lot of things、uh, like a lot of material that they cannot do anything anymore. Right?、Um, then you just realize that this this these buildings were consuming thirty percent of the country of the country 
output energy just for that right it's um it's a hijack of the energy system of the of the country right now the system is blockchain nonetheless behind where where is the decentralization here who 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 holds yeah, no, these people? No, no, no. I mean, this is one of the. I'm not. Okay. I'm, not I'm not asking you to. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not asking you to answer the question as as if you you had the necessarily the answers. I'm just saying like this is a kind of questions that you you need to ask because because it's it's not just a, it's not just an idea. It's a, it's something that I feel like is is dan it's actually dangerous to believe in because it it puts you in a situation where where if you believe in that. You 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 don't believe in in um, in the intent of that. You believe in the result of that, which which to me is two different things. You you could have the intent I, uh, of I decentralization. I have some information, Kevin. Actually, yeah. Uh, the thing is, like decentralization, uh, who 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 gets to say that? Who gets to decide? Right. I'm sure the people in power right now would not do that, right? Because they have. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't agree. They like, don't. who is building the blockchain? Who is building the blockchain? Is it poor people in the in developed country, in developing countries? <laughs> no, it's no, not. It's this not this is people that are that are wealthy. That no, if if that is the case, like, uh, who gets to like, especially Asian countries are dependent on U.S. clients and their whims. Like, whatever they want to design, they hire engineers and this thing. The problem is they want to solve it. And at times, don't we don't even feel like they are really a big problem. They are bigger problems in the hierarchy mm -hmm. of problems to solve in the world, right? But mm -hmm. who gets to decide? It's the market which is deciding, right? People well, having the money and the power. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why does well, that happen? No. That that means. So, I mean, like, we we are you're talking the 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 confusion that they, they exists with blockchain and then decentralization is um, is that you are taking like you are taking things that are at works at an individual level and you and people move that discussion into like an abstract level which is the the entire system which which is problematic like an, a, a personal identity is what you define it to be it should not be like stored in a system you should decide what goes into the system like the fact that we discussed that, that you know there's some principles in at least in some european countries that some things needs not to be measured needs not to be stored into in some way that this is your own to design where you put it right and 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 to me it's no, it's, a, it's a fair, it's a fair principle binary as well <laughs> no 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 i mean i mean i mean I mean i mean in, in that sense in, in that sense um that um the system like to work this kind of system, it requires data, even if it's decentralized. It requires people to play with be, within the rules that that will be set. Uh, that will be set, and and to me that is that is, I mean it, it does not solve any any problem. It, it actually creates the the very problem that it wants to solve. Then to be able to to even like if we go back to the discussion we we just had like about creating the problems because there's not enough problems is exactly that, no, that there is problem actually kevin uh, i'll tell you uh, if, if like it also depends on our values like if you believe that most wealth is by few section of uh, people in any country if you think that is a problem in general if you believe that is a fundamental problem there's yes. a concentration of uh, like less like yesterday or day before yesterday i was listening to this uh, investor who is like a big big fan of Warren Buffett and he has been following uh, mm -hmm. like Monish Prabhai or somebody I think he's pretty popular in even US investing circles mm -hmm. so he was talking about Kazakhstan so when uh, USSR split up uh, Kazakhstan is very big it's resource rich and it has just 10 million or 12 million people uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and he was saying that it is some it's the land area like the resource resources they have is way more than India. That's what he claimed. I did not verify, it. but let's take it uh, that statement. And once it split up, so a lot of state uh, state held right state control. But once it split up, now it was privatized and it was not done well. So now only 150 people hold the entire assets Kazakhstan. And they decide the fate of other people. 
and now if you what i if you feel that you need to have the agency to decide what you want what you don't want then you need you should not give the keys and control to those 150 people and uh, sometimes it triggers and there are revolutions happen like what happened is so the ta- like everybody needs oil to function in a country right so these people uh, the government has increased uh, the tax rate and it is the price of the oil like good 2 or 3x or something like that it just shake uh, everybody's budget and everything and at that moment uh, they are like why are you taxing us tax those 150 people who hold and in in just couple of days the government removed all the taxes and they said okay now the 150 people have to pay taxes or they mm-hmm. convinced those 150 people that now you have to do those acts like i'm doing this charity i'm doing this i'm doing that you have to do this you cannot just how do i put it um so this i have i have not completely believed but if there is like crazy automation and people do not know to unlearn and learn fast and be adaptable which is mm-hmm. most people and some people are helpless to do that because of external circumstances then they would be like relevant in the entire cog of functioning right yeah and then they cannot survive in this thing then it would be an apartheid system where only few would uh, ensure that their needs are met as good as possible they would control the resources everything and other people have to fight for the crumb that is yeah. a dystopian world which is possible and lot of uh, experts are saying the future would be medieval like how feudal lords used to have work in asia in like lot of indian countries every part there is feudal nature of it yeah that's why blockchain is important that's why decentralized and everybody who has observed this is they think that this is a problem i need to work and it is a major problem and that's why they are uh, working i agree i, I agree with the i agree with uh, the like, i agree with the i mean i agree with the what is called with the diagnosis but i don't agree with the solution i i i i, I mean to me there's a logical gap I, between I, I i mean i agree you can have like your opinion I, i'm just sharing mine and i respect yours and i understand that it seems to be important for you so i'm totally okay with that it's just, nothing against you again it's just about the ideas not about the people okay mm-hmm. i'm i'm I'm, I'm, truly, i'm truly i'm truly i'm actually like to me it's those the things that you are discussing are truly important and i i i i believe that we need to do something i'm not sure i, I I'm really skeptical to be frank. I'm not dismissing entirely no. the possibility that uh-huh. blockchain could be a solution. I'm not dismissing it, but I'm really skeptical of it because the people behind they have a philosophy of they they have something in their philosophy I I, I like right now I I don't want to go into the details of this of these things because it would uh-huh. be really too long and I would be pleased to discuss that, but I I do believe that this there's some really bankrupt ideas behind behind the the intent that that, that is displayed through throughout the solution But now now i, I like mean, it's, it's a it's a like it's a problem of things. sorry i'm just finish, just finishing to me it's a problem of governance it's not a problem of of uh, of um, a, a technical system um and i can tell you i work with uh, i work with people that are working into systems to just monitor forests and create shared value creation like cre- create shared value through monitoring uh, forests with with the help of local communities okay and i can tell you no system at all will replace human organization will replace a human governance and um like a, a, like, like a, a a computer system is necessarily a formal way of of exchanging information we are not uh we like we are when we are discussing together right now uh we are exchanging information in a, an informal way that conveys way more meaning and viability in what we are discussing that what a system a, an informatic system can do my identity is not um is not defined by whatever i would put in a system it will never be defined by that it will be defined with my interaction with others with my interaction with my with my surroundings it will be defined by the choice i make in everyday life 
okay it won't be defined through some kind of um, um, I don't know like some kind of um, uh, questionnaire I, I reply and I'd say oh this is your your this is my identity it's you know the to me that treating the system as if it was reality is confusing it's confusing the the, the, the map for the territory it's exactly that and it's it's dangerous because it makes it reduce things it, it removes diversity it's it simplifies too much for it to be a viable solution now if it if it exists in between so many layers that then, then 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 it works I'm fine with that but but the problem with people believing strongly in that, they, they, it's, it's an absolutism idea that you need to go through it all and entirely for it to work as it is proposed today. But it, it will mutate. It has to mutate because it, because it will face reality. It, it will face that fire exactly. money and economic system they won't fall. They won't fall. It, they will mutate as well. And they will, they will adapt to the to new realities. And uh, this is how systems and, and humans works in general. So I, I, I'm not scared of the of the of blockchain and stuff like that. I, I actually I study that and I, I use those kind of things on an everyday basis. So I, I understand them pretty well. I'm just saying that um, um, the problem is the idealism behind and the ideologies that it creates because people will will act and fight for some of these ideologies and it will be harmful for some. And, and this is, I believe, is, is something that we can see now with culture wars and the internet about, <laughs> about this kind of stuff and, and the weaponization of this kind of ideas against some form of capitalism, so against some form of, of, um, of uh, institutions that, uh, that for me plays a fundamental role in, in, in our society. Like we cannot, we cannot subtract uh, current form of institutions with technical systems. I think it's, it's, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't work. And and we can find like some some instances where they tried, and where it, it has some some di dire consequences. So I'm not generalizing. So again, I'm not afraid. I, I'm sure it will come up to something interesting, but I'm skeptical of the of the premises that that are set by 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 people either working for that to to be to to become a, a reality. Or people that are just like truly believing in, in this as a, as the best future possible. No, no, I, I get it. Yeah, I completely agree because uh, after you left last time we spoke, I was, I was talking to Matt. So mm -hmm. he was also talking about uh, everything, every entity to survive, they have to optimize for something. So they might start with an idealistic thing, but the end, uh, they have to optimize to, for growth to sustain. And that, that changes everything, the priorities, the yes. initial vision and everything die off and then the survival yeah. and growth matters and you know I, I it's put, also, I where, yeah go ahead sorry no, go ahead go ahead sorry ah, so uh, okay. The, okay so this is this is what matt shared and i agreed with it but then uh, when i see so this 30 percent of uh, energy which was taken by few countries and all these are kind of technical problems actually if any other blockchain or anything which comes which reduces it for example, Ethereum now moved from proof of work to proof of stake. They are trying to address that. Now they are using different sharding technology and that merging and all. So these are all technical solutions which will change with time with people and everything. Of course. Because, yeah, and it's all volunteer based to be honest. Like uh, they are not being, uh, maybe they are holding Ethereum. They have to hold because that value has to be also maintained to ensure that what the effort they are putting actually matters at the end of the day. And finding, I'm not telling it's like a panache or it's like it's, it has to be blindly implemented everywhere and it cannot be implemented because there would be friction. We cannot predict how the governments will behave, how the dictatorship behave or the people who play with everything so far. Uh, like how, how would they function? How would they deal with this new dynamic? That, and they would have their own way. It's all game theory again, I feel. So that has to happen. Hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's always fight within do a lot of ideas and uh, like decentralization centralization and we'll find somewhere yeah that's but I can I tell, I can tell you I can tell you two things like if you extrapolate the scenario in which blockchain and web3 works okay then you you will end up necessarily with monopoly and you know which one would be would, would it be internet service providers. Yeah. 
internet service providers. Internet service providers, okay. Yes, uh -huh. they will become the new yeah. monopoly. They, they will have to because we will be entirely dependent on their capabilities to serve people. If that is the case, Kevin, why is AT&T not the uh, highest market capitalized company? It's Apple. Because today it's not, it's not the, like you have to see it. Because uh, of regulation. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to see it from a, a broker perspective, okay? You will have a necessary need for exchange of information. And some people will be in place where they hold access um, passage for this information to go through, and they can they can they can uh, monetize this. And as soon as they, as they do it, they will become uh, they will they will you know um, make profit from that. And as any corporation and any business is made for 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 you know uh, increasing their their profits, they will tend to grow and they will tend to become monopoly and and. It, in fact, even today, there's not so much competitions and the uh, and, uh, internet service pro pro providers uh, yeah. uh, market. ISPs like it's 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 really narrow. Right yeah, ISPs listen to state, right? Yeah. Internet service providers listen to the regulations of the state, right? Yes, and but then but then you 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 enter in the 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 full um, um, issue with with this the, this thinking is like you will still need people outside of the system to set up regulations for the systems to work. Of course, of course. And if this, and if this institutions are not, different, different are not different um, uh, hold by the people, if they are like you described, like, uh, you know, um, um, uh, not democracies, but the, quite the opposite, um, then, then how, how fair it is in any case? Like how, how does that change anything about the state? Uh, of the state of the of the system, absolutely nothing. It changed nothing. Uh, I don't know. Like Matt, I think you unmuted a couple of times. You wanted to say something in between. I'm just marching in. No, I I like hearing the dialectic. Um, I if you want me to add anything, um, I I guess I could say a little bit about how, um, you know, privacy laws and regulation kind of force broadband providers and internet service providers not to be, you know, it caps their ability to look into your data. And so they're not allowed to be janitors. They can only be infrastructure managers. And so they make sure that the lines are, you know, of a good quality, a good maintenance quality and so on and so forth. And they tax you for that, right? But, they, but this is fragile need a regulation. It's so, fragile, especially so, in the US. So, so for Kevin, uh, what he's kind of talking about is no matter what kind of network you have, whether it's blockchain or money or anything, you need janitors and janitors that you can trust. The most important um, employees of any system or company are the janitors because if the toilets are not clean, nobody's going to be happy and you're not going to get any productivity, right? So they're the ground of, they're just the foundation of what you need, right? So you need janitors. And I guess, data janitors in a sense are data analysts just people who basically make sure that the protocol is safe for the end user right you don't actually need a ceo you don't even need a decision maker for any you know all of these things but you do need a couple of janitors who just know how to like get into the cracks and fix a few bugs uh, and fix customer complaints every once in a while right and and do you um, think, uh, like that's a great point do you think how Linux functions, how it gets developed and maintained, if that particular model is used in maintaining internet? Op open source. You're talking about open source. Yeah. And I, like, I mean, I love happens. the... So open source is one of those things where people like to say, hey, my product is open source or my platform is open source. You know, I have a wiki and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. And it's a lot of marketing. But true open source, right, uh, has actually a very very rigorous structure and protocol to it which exactly, is exactly. Do, do you commit like when there's a fork do you commit to this change and, and so on and so forth and and, and there's actually this whole, like there's, a, yeah, there's an agreement of, of uh, there's an agreement of not holding this control like you 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 put yourself in a place where you accept that others might interfere with your zone your zone of control, and that's totally fine because this is exactly the point, right? Yeah, and and the community manages this 
type of version control, which is yeah. that, you know, there's a self-governance of these protocols that I guess people kind of vote on or mm. you have some some very like high ranking credential person, somebody with some reputation kind of state exactly. that, you know, after a certain level of a certain amount of commitment, if the changes are big enough, then you then you go from version 15 to 16 and so on and so forth. Right. But really, they're just numbers. They're arbitrary in some sense. The, the, the real question is, does the community adopt these versions as they move on? And and how do you measure success of these versions and the open source project as a whole? Because what if, you know, like there's so many of these Linux um, forks, right? And some of these projects are just like gone by the wayside, Done. you know, never to ever be like even the, although the community and the project and the leaders and the developers are all very talented, there's no a, a adoption. So, yes. you know, you are also restricted by, I guess, your marketing and all that stuff yes. too. But there's, and, there's and so, a comp complementary stuff with the fact that the community that participates in the project is the the primary user of the project mm -hmm. itself, right? So right, right. that kind of reciprocity in the, in, the, in the participation is a form of of adoption as well in that sense. So, so, you know, a really key thing about the market when you participate in the market is also understanding that it rewards tenacity. It doesn't tend to reward competency as, as yes. well as you'd like. You think it's meritocratic, but it's not. It's really just about, <laughs> it's, it's about rewarding people who are, who, who accept no's and they, they mm. just continue, right? They, they iterate and continue and um, they, they don't take no for an answer and they just that's how that's what the market rewards people who really uh uh play the law of large numbers right who, who really are, are are immune to uh to to to, to pain um and and, and 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 so you know not everyone is built uh for success in the market and um and so you know these open source projects um you know the, the best protocols usually don't make it to be the highest market share. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of the issue. Yeah. It's, it's like the best solutions are really the one that succeeds. They, they, because, so that's because if, if they are... like the best solution, it's not possible. Like at the end, uh, how do I put it? Uh, because the system is designed in such a way that meritocracy, nobody knows what meritocracy is exactly, to be honest, like to, like to be precise uh, mm. and who gets to decide the definition who that involves gatekeeping itself so we can never be that okay so tenacity mm. is something which is rewarded I completely get it and it all also one more thing is the, the, the how the integrity and the trust so the actions which they take consistently for example uh, I can think of uh, this example of uh, when, when uh, for the first time uh, there was this thing called ICO, uh, initial coin offerings in 2017, and during that time, uh, after that, I think uh, something happened and there was a big hack in the eth Ethereum thingy. So when that happened, uh, uh, there was a huge conflict between two uh, groups of uh, Ethereum people. So one is that yeah. should we count that hack? as a part of blockchain and continue with the coin or we should fork it and re remove that particular thing. That's why uh, it separated. It became a, one more coin, Ethereum classic and this thing. Okay. So that, that split happened and a lot of people stayed with uh, the people who, who did not count that action. Okay. Because they, th they thought that is not something as humanity we should value. Okay. And that's where the integrity part was there. And now the entire group of uh, very smart people are maintaining entire thing. Now, whatever progress they made, now those use cases of DAO or uh, N NFTs for now. So I don't know how many N uh, use cases might happen through this particular thing. But basically, uh, this is what I'm trying to tell. So the innovation will happen. Nobody can say what is best unless it is tested in the market and people. We can fantasize it until and unless it's applied in the large scale and it's being Sometimes some solutions are effective at small places. Nobody can tell anything for sure. So, that, right, exactly. You know, here's here's one example of um, something that is so successful. 
you know, the programming language Python, right? Everybody mm -hmm. loves Python. Python's great for machine learning, blah, 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 blah. You know what? One of the biggest weaknesses of Python is exactly the same uh, weakness that you attribute to a lot of the energy consuming uh, blockchain technologies, right? It's that whenever you launch Python, you have to install NumPy and all that stuff, you know, those, yeah. those packages that you need in order for Python to really do what you want. Mm. And, and yeah. that's, that whole act is this huge redundant layer where you have to just, you know, basically install the same code into your RAM. <laughs> and, and it's ridiculous and it's a big waste of time and energy. I mean, it's not a big waste of time, you know, don't get me wrong, but what I'm saying <laughs> is that this, the, the huge... It's not optimized. Success. It could be optimized. Exactly. Yeah. Python was never optimized for this success. It was yeah. never designed to be the success. Yeah. Again, the, 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 the originators of Python, this, and this is really the true beauty of it, was it wasn't really even an open source collaboration. It was just like 15 people in a van, right? Um, who who just wanted to make something that was true to the to their ideology to their philosophy of what mach, like a machine language coding should be and mm -hmm. when they made that elegance work out then it became a huge hit right it, mm -hmm. it was like it was like a blockbuster album hit right but in the in the computer programming world and it was never optimized again for yeah. energy but I, I would say I would say that this is where I, I, we tend to, to define the market as, as this entity that def, you know that makes decision at some point, and I'm, I'm personally I'm I'm not comfortable with that definition um, because because the, the the market is not just a, a group of individuals; it's a group of the individuals that obeys to certain rules that the market predefines. Right? There's some rules, some rules, some explicit ones, and some tacit ones of what what makes the dynamics in the the markets right, and and this is true to an ex, to to this extent of deciding who wins and who loses. Uh, that means that in any market, some are bounded to succeed and some are bounded to fail, right? Without the like without the fact that it's a good solution or not, that people are brilliant or not, that people are, as you mentioned, Matt, um, you know that that they keep trying whatever. Whatever are the odds and whatever whatever people are saying about what they are trying to achieve, right? That's if they yes, if they try enough, they might succeed, but they might not succeed because they tried enough. It's not you know it's not uh, necess necessarily true. Yeah, yeah. And, you, you need you need a little bit of combination of a lot of things. Yeah, but, yes. but tenacity tends to be rewarded if you have the right product. Yes, because because if you increase the number of, of you know, if you if you gain like, uh, like if you are in the market and you are bond, some are bonded to succeed and some are bonded to fail, if you gain like thirty times, you have more chance of succeeding than if you gain just five times, right? If you play, yeah, yeah, so and, and free, and that's, you, that's, you do get that's normal, you do right? get some benefit of frequency accumulation. So exactly. like you know when you well, so like when you see an ad for a product several times then you tend to associate yes. a little bit more halo to it right true like true. as if it's been but, if it's as if it's been in the market for a longer time than yeah. it really is yeah but i'm just I'm just pondering the fact that it, it's not it's not because people have, are in a certain way that they succeed it's because the the market uh, defined the rule like the market has some right, right, right. principles right. that makes it works in a certain way that that favorizes this kind of like it is yeah, exactly yeah. like a, it, uh, evolution it's not that and, the market and back it's not that the market pressure. chooses tenacity yeah, exactly. people it's that tenacity people are survivor bias exactly you know, exactly it's a it's a selection bias of uh, of the ecosystem right in yes, that sense yeah. so right. sorry no. you, you you we we lost you for for a bit but we, I was just redefining how yeah how um, yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, you see, this is because we were talking about blockchain and, and, uh, and internet service providers. We, it's 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 not a good sign. Yeah, so someone is listening to you. I was thinking about ISPs. 
Exactly, I was going to say the same. <laughs> Maybe the ISPs are not happy. <laughs> So uh, we were just yeah. discussing about the, the the market and and what, what because I, I I'm not so comfortable with the idea that the market is, is like this entity that that defines who wins and then that makes some decisions. It's like um I was, as I was uh, as I was saying, it's like it's a it's not just a group of people. It's a group of people that obeys to certain rules that are some are explicit, some are tacit, and and the the common explanation of what makes the market is that. Some people are bonded to succeed and some people are bonded to fail, right? And then this is what we discussed with Matt is that um, this is a selection pressure for some type of behaviors uh, against others in that sense. Even non-market markets, like for instance, yes. the governments that are choosing which projects to fund, yes. they have a selection bias rule, which is that they cannot fund projects as projects. They have yes. to choose people. They have can, to choose the sponsors, right? And, and so, they cannot not found a project because as, as soon as they are in this, you know, this is what is weird, weird in that case. It's uh, as soon as they are in this endeavor of founding something, they will find something. It's it, there's some, you know, rudimentary redem, rule that makes it that this, there's a, some, find, uh, some, 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 some form of determinism about uh, the results, that something will be found, like a project will be found. Is, is it the best? Not necessarily. It, it, is it the one that we need? Not necessarily. Is um, you know is uh, exactly that uh, we were discussing, discuss, discussing, and and just yeah, so, so, yeah. so we're talking about non-market markets. You know, it's yes. it's really it's not so much about um, these. Uh, it's about selection criteria. You know, designing the right selection criteria, and then you actually get the results and outcomes. So yeah, sorry. Yes. Yes. No, no, I, I was interested in uh, the mention you, you, you made from um, Genitos. And um, we can state that um, a true open, open source uh, community is, in fact, a form of governance by the, the Genitos. That the one that's, that's you know, sustained the, the entire infrastructure are the one that makes the decisions, are the one that's, that, that actually have the real power, which is not always true, especially not true in capitalism. And not always true in in um, in, um, in society in general, but it's interesting is that um, like there's there's a saying about that that uh, if you want to know how an organization work, go to the janitors and they will tell you all the stories and all the things that are you know in the in the uh, behind the scene of uh, what is visible, right? And because they they, they hold an inherent um, uh, power, which is knowledge, which is the inf access to information. Because of what they are doing as a, you know, as activities that not not everyone has access to, and um, I think it was a, a recommendation that someone uh, I don't remember who, like a real not re renowned person that made to to a CEO that if you want to know your company, go to the the janitor and then you will know. Um, and um, um, and where I was going at with that is uh, yes, um, and and. Um, um, there's, there's this discussion about the, the the fact that we need to like the notion of participation with retribution to the system, right? Uh, which I find is interesting, which is not true in in capitalism. That many people will uh, will participate, but not everyone will have retribution about their participation. That it, it won't be uh, necessarily true. Uh, and and I think I think that this is one of the missing part of the discussion about blockchain is it's not true either in blockchain. It's not because it's decentralized that it's it's equitable, or um, that it's uh, it's a fair it's fair, right? Yeah, um, if you've seen um, Silicon Valley, uh, the HBO series. I don't hear you well. Sorry. Uh, uh, HBO series of uh, Silicon Valley. Yes. Uh, one of the things was about you know the fifty one percent of hacks of the blockchain. <laughs> I mean, again, like it's it, it really just the blockchain is a, sim it's a symbolic representation of digitalized asset, right? And equity asset can be a symbolic representation of what is a blockchain, right? And, um, and so there's this idea of the 51% of that. I'm sorry, it's like you, your hand is covering your mic, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh so like. Now it's very good. 51% attack, right, is, is where 
if you own 51% of the coins, then you have governance, you know, um, yeah. yes. essentially you're a monopoly of the network and then you can build the, your own rules and then you can try to like manipulate the rules. And so one of the um, issues of, you know, all blockchain technology is that they all probably start with good intentions if that That's allows true. them to grow initially they grow initially and then they taste a little bit of success. And when they taste success, they're like, I'm going to attribute this KPI, which is growth, right? This positive thing with, you know, um, what we are going to try to focus on for the next year. And then, mm -hmm. and then you get more success. And then all of a sudden you become evil. You become exactly the problem that you're trying to solve. And, you know, this, uh, you, you, when you begin to think, for, for just the moment of, um, you know the difference between tactical and strategic, right? Tactical is when you have a very high certainty that this outcome will happen. Yeah. Then you make your decisions or you make your positioning, yes. your financial you know, betting based upon that. Strategic means you assume that you could be wrong. But if you, even if you're wrong, you're not completely destroyed. So you made a strategy where you open up your decision, you know, your universe, your degrees of freedom, right? So that's the dif difference between strategic and tactical. When blockchain janitors or, you know, the, the, the founders or whatever, um, when they taste success, they, they immediately attribute that success as an intrinsic property of what they've created. Yes. And yes. then they begin to think tactically. And when they think tactically, they, they sow the seeds of their destruction. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. And they, they attribute inherent values to protocols and to... Yeah, yeah. And which, to, which, like, is stupid, which is insane. Yeah. Yeah, this, is, this, is, uh, this is where, um, you know, like this is where you really confuse the map for the territory. This is where you, you, yeah. you lost your ground you're grounding into reality reality yeah you go to investors yeah. and you say the reason why you should invest in our protocol is because we have the best protocol yes. our blockchain has the best protocol like yes how do you measure that why why, why, why would you even say that <laughs> yes 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 I, I i do feel like this decentralization is is truly bankrupt it's 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 not possible it's not really possible it's it, distribution is decentralization is that like as soon as you have a network of people interacting some people will have privilege to, to, uh, to towards action and some won't that's um, like it's not us who define that it's you know the physics of networks that like some so, some, some right, people right. So, will be able to act upon some knowledge that they have because the the network is not like like internet itself is an example that access to information does not equate better decisions it does not equate uh, fair share of knowledge. It's not true. It's like it's it's a false statement from the beginning. We know it's false, but still, still the the, the idea that the blockchain keeps everything, that keeps everything, and so anyone can knows about anything at any time, won't make the system like you know fairly distributed. It will be distributed, and then at some point, some local information will be privileged. Some people will act upon this privilege. They will create stronger networks more tight and, and efficient network at their local level, they will grow, they will accumulate power, they will make, you know, and, and that, that's how it works. It's, it's, I mean, I don't know how can you, you cannot see that if you understand so, so, how uh, networks work. It's, it's a suggestion for your map idea, or yeah. your, 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 your topology idea. Um, I, I suggest that we make it based upon, you know, like these mountains, contain some kind of mineral that you have mm. to mine right <laughs> and your job is actually to be a miner and you you can you can collect a big block of uh rocks and then you put it into you know the refinery and you collect x amount of materials right minerals or whatever and, and i mean like it could be a different distribution of gold silver whatever call it whatever you want but the the the, the idea of mining right is is really just about when you are searching for things you happen to come across 
a few things that may or may not have value. And, and but but you 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 take a long uh, strategic uh, approach of grabbing a lot of rocks, crumbling it up, and seeing what the compositions are, mm-hmm. right? And and so you know, like one of the things is like, how do you look for good points of mining? Like, where do you mine uh, yeah. for data? So taking this analogy just a little bit more abstractly and not not focusing too much on on the topology here, that's Mm -hmm. something you can explore later. But basically, data is raw, um, is a very raw thing, right? It's raw, it's your raw minerals. Um, When you refine, um, you know, crude oil into gasoline or, Mm -hmm. you know, just something that's more useful, then it becomes information. And, And the Internet gives you a lot of information. So, you know, you're basically in the commodity trade. Yeah. Structured information, so you add a different profile to it, you know, another property. Structured information means that it's gas that is useful. You know, you, you put in gasoline, not for vacation, but for, you know, a truck to deliver goods, and then you could get a higher return from the transportation, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. so so structured is is is, you know, you can get more out of it's a higher roi right structured information is just roi uh information not all structured information are is good information though right because you could like you know do child trafficking it's it's profitable to do a lot of like you know drug Mm. dealings and arms dealings Mm. and all that stuff right so you have to add another layer to it which is you, you want structured information but you also want um socialized structured information or some kind of like verified or or reputational structured information and then that is is the thing that you want to uh, as a network uh incentivize or at least Mm -hmm. you know um give it some kind of like gold seal of approval or you know yeah yeah add that property right yeah yeah i agree I agree, but, but this is this is a, a real discussion that is not present in what you just said is makes sense to me, and this whole discussion about like looking beyond the technology itself, like, looking at what it means in terms of interactions, like you know how how can you not foresee a situation where let's say we all have blockchain, let's say you you have a digital identity. Like there's no way for you, uh, like just access to that system is already a form of privilege, right? Like you cannot yeah. guarantee that the, the entire population on Earth has a, a, an equal and 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 an equal fair sh- uh, access to to this to this technology. It's it's not possible. Even in a developed country, it's it's not possible, right? You cannot guarantee that. So. There's already an inequality um, in, built in the system just for accessing it. But let's assume that, let's say for the sake of the argument, that everyone has access to, like let's say in, in your country, Matt, everyone has access to, it's a, a right from birth, okay, that's a common thing that ev- everyone has, okay? You have your digital identity. Then you will see opportunities in the real world. Right, the one that is external to that system, then you will input that opportunities into the system. As soon as you do that, you had a leverage that others don't have because you perceive something in your immediate context that didn't make sense to others, but makes sense to you. And that enables you to act, enables you to, to make a decision. This is the privilege yeah. of information, right? Of uh, action, sorry. And, well, and also in- encryption too is a, is a very, very big issue uh, yes. so like you have raw data but i'm just also... trying to escape the the notion of yeah. uh, of the technology Te- just for the sake of the argument. Yeah. Be- because yeah. because because the discussion today is about technology and as as uh, anvesh said like it's it's just engineering issue like it can be solved right you could yeah. you could argue for the fact that energy consumption that um, the the pollution that it creates that whatever mm-hmm you know engineering issue can can be solved at some point and uh it would be difficult to argue against that right yeah but we can argue about the the moral values of 
of the extent of the idea that if you go outside of the technology, you go outside of the engineering uh, issues, then you realize that there's something that 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 that, that just does not work, right? That you can criticize as as a as a moral statement more than just a technological uh, stuff, right? It's it's not just uh, the one ones. It's 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 actually like a, so a societal model that 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 people want to enforce through technology, which is already just as a basis of of a statement is is questionable. It, do we allow people to enforce societal model through technology? Do we want that to, to happen? That's, mm, yeah. you know, and especially people that want to gain money from that. Like, it's not free. It's not, you know, all that system, all those systems, they want to earn money from that. They want to, to make benefits from people using their system. It, yeah, I mean, that, that's a well-framed, uh, that's a well-framed concern. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is where I'm really skeptical. I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm sure that if we want it to work, we will make it work uh, as, as purely as an engineering, you know, a challenge. I'm sure we can do it. Uh, it will take time and, and probably it will, you know, I, I, regress. I, 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 I personally, I think technology is one of those things where it's a iterative improvement over time. You have the right, mm. Uh, code or whatever, uh, it will always. You can always improve it with later versions. So the the key thing yes. isn't if the technology is superior. That's not a reason to invest, right? What you do need, however, is you know a good uh, trust uh, mm -hmm. uh, with. You have you have to have a good sustainable trust model uh, with your stakeholders, with your yeah. users. Um, if you for instance, like, or you have a growth model which allows you to lie in the beginning, and when you achieve growth and lift off, then it's fine. Yeah. Um, and you can but, tell the truth. Yeah. Do, do you agree with that? Within a, such a system, like everything is because it's it's because it's informatic, you know, because it's it's zero and ones. Everything needs to be explicitly, like written somewhere, like explicitly inputted in the system. That there won't be any place more, uh, any more place for ambiguity, and the, the ambiguity will lie outside of the system. But but if we internalize to the system many things that we 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 take as granted as social activities, mm -hmm. then then it becomes something with less meaning, right? It will become so something with less value to us and and it will come, become something that we would like to measure upon which is a, an issue that we don't measure the success of our uh social interactions i don't today right now i'm not measuring it right i'm not so putting still... kpis on it i'm not measuring like um i would like to improve our in abilities to discuss together like by yeah, by two yeah. percent you know it makes no uh, sense right it makes no so, sense. so so the human psychology creates a invisible firewall between our consciousness and our unconsciousness and i i believe that it is vital to human psychological health to maintain that firewall mm. because um you know there are there are philosophers that have discussed if you don't have this firewall then several truths about your unconsciousness and your experiences throughout life might surface and might arise that will deeply disturb you and you will not be able to process it. You won't function as a human being. You're going to have a lot of issues. So, yeah. so maintaining a firewall between your consciousness and unconsciousness is vital for human health, mental health, period, right? <laughs> that means, of course, what you do and how you act, are they're going to diverge. That is okay, okay? Now, <laughs> if you have, you know, your, if your digital footprint is constantly coming back at you, fed back to you, you lost the firewall. You lost the battle. Your mental health is gone. Okay. Yeah. If you're reminded about the internet, your security, digital identity, you are, your firewall disappears. It's gone. You've lost your mental health. And, and, and you we have some want to find of... a way to win, right? Yeah. 
Sorry. We have a we, we and I just wanted to add to so, to what you were saying. Like we have some form of um, intrinsic um, protection from the lack of monitoring of every aspect of our life. Like the fact yeah, that it's this called bad, it's called bad technology, and sometimes we just embrace that. You know? <laughs> We, we sometimes love the old stuff, right? It's, yeah. it's because it doesn't have the whole sensor um, economy, right? Yeah. But, but, you know, here's another thing. The, the digital world creates these chips with 50 billion transistors in, with the size of my fingernail. Mm -hmm. Within that energy, within that um, information density, within the transistor density of, of, of these chips, you can incorporate the ability to process of ones and zeros uh, everything in the physical world. You, you potentially have that, that um, technological capacity. The, the question is, um, is it worth the investment in sensors, additional sensors to incorporate you know, the physical world with the digital and create this melt um, and, and, and kind of break the firewall? Or you know, melt the firewall away and and, and have this cybernetic uh, mixture. Mm -hmm. I would say that there's some value, there's some information value, but it's not. But you have a create a negative value and create pollution. Yeah, if this is you yeah. damage yeah. the firewall of, of of people's psychology, right? Yeah, I agree. People's mental space and and personal freedoms. Um, you don't you don't really think about it in terms of this model that people have this firewall between their consciousness and unconsciousness but yeah. it is it is deeply true that you need it in order to function um because I, you I need to have the separation i it, tend to you know, agree i tend to agree with you i'm i'm, I'm more like uh leaning towards uh, embodied cognition and i i do believe that this there's more than just this separation that this uh, something about how we interact with the physical world that is necessary for us to function uh, this is mm -hmm. something I, 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 I strongly believe, and, and even more so than a few years ago. Um, and um, I'm personally like more okay with the idea that we have like some kind of um, uh, hybridation of the physical and the, the digital. I, I'm okay with that. But yeah, yeah. as soon as we do, like we do the same thing as we were discussing with economy, like we do like a careful energy allocation in the sense that we decide to not monitor some things. We decide to leave it to the people to decide how they want to use it for themselves. That there's some space for personal discovery, for personal, um, like that, that, that we don't yeah. need, we don't need to know what they are doing in order yeah. to, to, to understand how the, like we, there's this weird, you know, position where now we were talking about money, but, you know, anything can be like this can be transformed to. We can talk about the, the the tokens as derivative of the value, right? In that sense, and and measurement is a token that value uh, as much as money. That's that the the metric that these organizations are putting over here, and the reason why they are even monitoring you on the internet, right? Is is that because it's interesting for them? It's not because they they are truly building better uh, predictive models about what you will buy. It's not. I mean, it's not that true. This is not that true, right? There's many things that they monitor that they don't use. Actually, there's so there's so much waste in in what we actually measure, right? And we can see that in absolutely any organization. I work in many, and I can tell you that they they measure stuff that they don't they don't care, they don't use. But they do it nonetheless because because measurement on itself is valued. It's a token of um, of um, I don't know of the of the well being. Of, like it's perceived as a token of the well being of the uh, organization itself, right? So organizations do what we do with our memories, right? We, when we experience things, they're in our memories, but we don't we don't access them all the time. But yeah. they're they're experiences that we still have, and. The thing is, we have this firewall for a reason, because we do not want our memories leaking into our our current space, because then mm. it's occupied and we cannot function. Yeah. But we have 
this firewall also for the purpose of that we can go past the firewall if we need to. And this is when we are relaxing, we want to meditate, we can access some modes of our unconsciousness, we know, mm. we know how to navigate those paths and then bring some lessons and bring it back into conscious mind to, to, to operate and play with. Yeah. Same thing with, you know, uh, playing with the digital and the internet uh, data. It's the same thing in how organizations operate. They collect all of it. It's stored in their unconsciousness. When they, if they hire a talented enough data analyst with paired <laughs> with, you know, a talented enough statistician paired with a talented enough, uh, you know, uh, 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 ML um, engineer, yeah. They work together to create a data scraper. They execute a plan to access the unconsciousness, create this meditation process to access behind the firewall, gather something, some insight, and then they can play with that, right? Yeah. But usually it's, you know, they don't need to know that it's particularly you. They don't need to target you. Uh, but sometimes that could be useful if you want a suggestion, um like let's say you're you know you're looking for you know curtains you know for your for your wallpaper or something like that. i don't know and and, yeah. and it gives you some suggestions that you actually want right it gives you suggestions that you want it's not invasive it's it's just a service right the the, the real question is how much do they know about you how much of your unconsciousness have you allowed you know out in the yeah. open right uh, but it's realizing it's 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 yeah i i tend to agree although i feel like there's a there is um there is a, a difference in treatment that, that we cannot equate totally like the the, the an organization as a, as a as an organism right um, it's that the finality the the, the ends uh there's an end to there's a they try to achieve something uh, which is not, um, um, you know, um, uh, autopoiesis. It's not something that it relates to its survival uh, in relation to its ecosystem. It it, it aims to extract value, um, and and it's it's mainly based on that, right? It's, it's I mean, there's an if 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 an organization were were a, a real organism, it will have an organ to take value out of the ecosystem that would be so huge in proportion to its body that it would be ridiculous, right? If it, if it, it would be like if we had, uh, I don't know, extreme long, you know, arms with big hands and we can grab up, up you know, about anything uh, about yeah. everywhere. Well, it would be, yeah. it would be insane to imagine some kind of organism that, that does only that, 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 you know, that extract more than, than it needs, that, that, has this capacity to to go in places where, where where it doesn't need to be, but still does because why not? Because you know, because well, it's it's it, it's, it's kind of like a negative security uh, uh, concept. So, like when you think of positive security, you think of um, you know firewalls and these protection layers and walls, yeah. right? Just the, the idea that information uh, does not get in or out it's just protected right it's it's it, very huge borders right basically you can't get into the border there's this type of negative security which is um you need to access yeah you take everything you take everything in case of and you never in know maybe of, exactly yeah, like maybe like, like the cia, CIA yes. you know intelligence right yes. they, they gather it because they need to go back into the tapes. They need to go back in history and find out root causes, right? Yes. So, so, yeah, I mean, that that is also security, but it's, it's a different form of it. It's like a negative space of it where you do it in case of. And um, I think that there is a right for everybody to uh, pay uh, for this in case of security. The, the question is, how much does that infringe on other people's, you know, unconsciousness, right? Their, their mm. unconscious rights. Um, you, you know, you, you, can't, you can't go back. But, the, 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 but sorry, just before you go in the tangent you, you are <laughs> taking right now, I'm sorry. Yeah. There's something I do feel like is, is, is problematic in the definition of privacy today. 
yeah. it's 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 still in the belief that you know it's, it's you know today privacy is framed around data ownership, right? Yeah. But this is exactly where my problem is. It's like it's about the fact that it, you need the data already in the system, and then you define who is owner of it, right? And who has right to use it. But it's so already a commitment to to the ideology of, of in case of it's already a commitment to that it's it you know and and i i, I would argue you don't need basically the, the language data. is already designed in a way where it's yeah. already assumed the the, the, yeah. the assumptions yeah exactly mm -hmm. well, well my, my point is you don't need in this place if this data is not in the in the system in the first place i uh, um which i if the data is is not in the in in the system in the first place, then no one can access it. Then no one needs it in case of anything. Then no one can you know like it's like, yeah it it is somewhere, but it's not accessible to others, right? It's like it, I don't know if there's a good analogy to 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 that. Well, thing. so That's... here's here's one of the issues of false choice is that. Um, uh, my 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 uh, uh, sister in law just had a wedding, and um, everybody you know does videos of mm. the, uh, and photos and all that stuff. It takes a lot of uh, you know uh, spiker plots, you know a lot of like you know uh, 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 safe you know, like your your space in your phone, right? And so storage space, and and you you know not everybody pays for uh, iPhone like iCloud storage, right? And so. Um, yes we need to figure out a way that is cost effective and simple to just share this stuff. Um, and, you know, yeah. I, I made a NAS system and, and all that stuff, but not everybody in the family knows how to use yes. FTP. Uh, yes. servers. It's, it's complicated. Like it's, it's not accessible. It's a long, yeah. yeah, it's a long lost art. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's and true. Today's, you know, tech, technology newbies, they only know one thing, which is like, Google servers yeah. and Amazon and that's funny because this this idea like in in, in France they are speaking of this idea of um, of uh, new commons and and defining the internet as as a common right and to state that that in fact it should it shouldn't be the the it shouldn't be owned by anyone that it's it's a common place it's exactly like a park that uh, anyone has access to uh, and 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 in the, in that sense, you could say, well, um, that it should be, if we if we bring it like back to the physical world, and you say that your 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 photo that you take with your your digital device is actually real objects in the the physical world, and you have to store it somewhere. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. um, would it be interesting to say that? Um, you have some kind of communal place where you can store, like anyone can store their their photos there, right? Yeah, but and that the, everyone could, could like like you know that it, it's a. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure what I'm just saying, right? But it's just well, this, well, idea, this idea it, that it needs. So so there there is this idea that storage space is a good. Yes. That, um, it is a good, and the question is who who provides the infrastructure for this good? Yes. And there is an end-use license agreement at the end of the day when you use Google servers or when you use Amazon servers, and yeah. it allows them to access the data and use and train their you know image recognition software, so then they yes. can identify people and blah blah blah. But as a result, you do get the storage for free. So even though storage is really cheap, like I could buy, I, again, I bought the NAS and I set it up perfectly. It's just, <laughs> you have to, you have to educate dumb people, um, to, to use, you know, a, a simple solution and the lowest common denominator user ultimately defines your product. Uh, and you know, this is, this is Peter principle working in reverse here, right? <laughs> Peter principle is, about you know you promote everybody to yes. the point where they suck at their job, and now you have this thing on the other side, the consumer end of the side, where um, your your lowest common denominator, your stupidest user, ultimately <laughs> defines the, the limits of your product. 
the limits <laughs> of your product's capabilities and also the ecosystem's yeah. um, market choice. We're actually talking about market choice here, which is I am not allowed to scale up my NAS system because the lowest common denominator uh, forced me into a market choice that I didn't want. But but do you agree that if you if you transpose that into our physical world, that you would expect um, um, some form of institution to maintain and provide you access to this kind of service as as public transportation is is useful to citizens um, why not um, why not uh, having like uh, a public service of digital services that, that are... yeah yeah like 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 a government that does it stupidly right yeah or or you know another way to think about it is this iCloud is a stupid storage service <laughs> you know they don't do image recognition they just they just you just have to pay a little bit more for the iCloud yeah. uh, and and I mean that's that's where different companies they stand by their branding right Google is about collecting the data Amazon's about collecting the data Apple wants to be the negative space uh, yes. of the corporations and you know that's that's a, that's a smart and strategic Uh, positioning okay. and it's strategic positioning because they could be wrong but it doesn't matter because it doesn't hurt them ultimately their yeah. core product is the device yes and the and, and the surrounding satellite service yes is exactly the, the, eco the ecosystem is resilient because if like one bits fail one part fail it, it won't yeah. necessarily yeah, yeah well, necessarily well, uh, we're talking yeah. about strategy versus tactic yes apple chooses strategy google and amazon chooses tactic It does. It, there's no right answer. The the real thing is survivorship, right? We're talking about market. Yeah, Who but survives? but but they can sustain the tactics. Uh, like this is where it's interesting. Like they can throw money at tactics and losing at tactics tactics without any problem, right? Amazon and, and Google has so many money, so much money that they cannot. Like, they yeah, can yeah, do yeah. that so, so, for so a long can, time. If, yeah. So so for them. Um, screwing up on tactics is just R and D for them, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. the R and D budget, and they yeah. have an R and D budget of like 20 to 30 percent. Most most should be about five percent for companies. You know, R and D yes. is healthy, but you know, 20 to 30 percent R and D means they could screw up a lot, and that means yes. they're allowed to do a lot of information, uh, uh, data scraping, right? Yes. And and so this is this is your fear ultimately is is that. They, their, their financial clout allows them to play very risky, dangerous bets that um, are highly leveraged, that no companies usually are allowed to even think about or contemplate about, but yeah. they can do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I guess that's right. Yeah, that, that is, is right. And, and that, that it's not really... Like no one's want to regulate that. That's that's the weird. Yeah, if 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 the regulators are dumb, too dumb to regulate, then they don't <laughs> even know to, that it's even a problem yet, right? Yeah. So so this is this is one of those unknown no, unknowns, right? Yes. There's no knowns. There's unknown unknowns. There's known unknowns. This is one of those unknown unknown problems, which yes. is like we don't even we don't even have regulators that are smart enough to understand what they are attempting to grasp at the moment. yeah because because it doesn't have to come from regulation first this is where also there's a kind of misunderstanding that it comes from policy first and then regulation right there's some kind of uh, the one one necessitates the other to 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 actually have a space to regulate if, and if the precognition of policy is you first have to have awareness exactly. if there's no awareness then there's no policy and so must policies works on precedence because of that right uh, because it needs it needs the recognition of something happened then we take decision but it, it's, it's it's the decision because it's reaction it's not it's not really action right you wait on something it, it, happening to make a decision it's too it's already too late the, the harm have, have been done that you didn't prevent it anything you didn't actually perform your role of um, giving direction to a community um, Uh, to a society, right? You you waited on the direction to be imposed to you. 
Which is so, always a risky, a risky way to like. It's not always done like that because we. It's not always done like that, but I yeah. do feel like, especially in the U.S., it's it's mainly played this way because it's easier to play this way. That's that, you know, it's 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 less costly because you wait on things to happen and then you you act, you react, and, and that, that's easy. You know, reality just proves you right. You don't have yeah. to you don't have to do anything for that, right? You know, this is one of those cases where I think with technology, regulators have misplayed uh, strategically what technology is yeah. uh, and how it would assimilate into society. And I'll give you one example. Uh, Microsoft antitrust. It's, it's basically, you know, we applied a policy which is using antibiotics to treat bad actors, right? Which is antitrust. Mm -hmm. You saw that Microsoft was trying to dominate the, you know, basically the operating system and also the Internet Explorer uh, space, right? Basically yes. the browser space. And um, they were embroiled in antitrust lawsuits for about... Hmm. Matt, I lost you. I lost you. Well, I think um, <laughs> we have to end this here. I'm I'm getting really tired and and I need to to I'm, I need to eat something as well. So we we'll just stop the recording. But it was really interesting.